Anti-Fragile, Things That Gain from Disord, Nassim Taleb. Here is a summary, the author introduces the concepts of fragility, robustness, and anti-fragility. Anti-fragile things gain from disorder and volatility. Many things are anti-fragile, including evolution, technology, the free market, and overcompensation mechanisms. Anti-fragility depends on the fragility of individual parts. The modern world denies anti-fragility by trying to eliminate volatility and seeking predictability. This is misguided and even harmful. There are two types of randomness, mediocristan, where extremes are rare, and extremistan, where extremes are typical. Decentralized, bottom-up systems are better suited for extremistan. Many modern interventions are naive and ignore anti-fragility, often causing more harm than good. Non-intervention and optionality are preferable. New technology and innovation emerge from tinkering and randomness, not teleological research. Prescriptive education and corporate directives hamper anti-fragility. In medicine, convexity effects and non-linearity mean that less can be more when it comes to intervention. Iatrogenic, harm caused by the healer, must be avoided. Ethics require skin in the game. People must have downside exposure to the consequences of their actions. Asymmetry and insulation from risk encourage fragility. The key ideas are to design systems, institutions, and individual lives to benefit from volatility, embrace randomness, and become anti-fragile. This is achieved by decentralization, bottom-up processes, evolution, optionality, skin in the game, and minimizing intervention when possible. The modern world's denial of these concepts often does more harm than good. The book is about anti-fragility, defined as things that gain from disorder. The anti-fragile loves randomness and uncertainty. The anti-fragile gets better with stressors, errors, and volatility. Examples include evolution, technology, culture, cities, bacteria, etc. The book aims to develop a systematic guide to decision-making in the face of uncertainty by understanding anti-fragility. It is easier to see if something is fragile than predict the event that may harm it. We can detect anti-fragility by seeing if something has more upside than downside from random events. Many modern systems have been made fragile by suppressing randomness and volatility. Complex systems get weakened or die when deprived of stressors. Top-down policies and structures often fragilize systems by overprotecting them. Bottom-up systems thrive on some stress and disorder. Some people become anti-fragile at the expense of others by taking the upside of volatility but exposing others to the downside risk. This is hard to see due to the complexity of institutions and the blindness to anti-fragility. In the past, those who took risks had status, now risks are concealed. The book discusses domains like, evolutionary biology, technology, medicine, business, ethics, politics, prediction, and philosophy. The overall message is to make systems anti-fragile rather than fragile. Anti-fragility determines what is living, organic, and complex. We are witnessing the rise of inverse heroes bureaucrats, bankers, academics, and Davos attendees who gain from the system but face little accountability or downside. They exert much control over society despite taking a little personal risk. Black swans are unpredictable, irregular events that have massive consequences. They shape history but we underestimate their role because we have an illusion of predictability and smoothness. We fear black swans and overreact to them. Many human systems are fragile to black swans but rarely benefit from them. Complex systems like society have many interdependencies that lead to non-linear responses and unpredictability. New technologies are making the world more complex and less predictable. It is hard to calculate the probabilities of rare events like black swans. We know less about rare events but try to predict them with false confidence. Only nature is an expert at dealing with black swans through anti-fragility. More than robustness is required. Everything fragile will eventually break. We need anti-fragility a mechanism by which the system regenerates itself through random events. Many anti-fragile things dominate the world, not centralized control or planning. Fragility is measurable but risk is not, especially for rare events. We can compare how fragile things are but not calculate the risks of black swans. Anti-fragility is the opposite of fragility and also measurable. Fragilistas underestimate what they do not understand or cannot see. They think reason and science can explain everything. They build fragility into systems by trying to exert too much control. Modern culture has less appreciation for the mysterious and unpredictable. In summary, the rise of inverse heroes and fragility, the unpredictability of black swans, the fragility of complex systems, and the limits of risk measurement and scientific control all point to the need for incorporating anti-fragility, distributed, bottom-up adaptability and gain from disorder. Overall, 
we need to appreciate uncertainty and randomness more in an increasingly unpredictable world. The author describes the concept of fragility those who engage in artificial policies and actions with small benefits and potentially huge unseen costs. There are many types of fragility, such as medical, economic, and social. Simple systems and policies are better than complicated ones. Complicated systems lead to unforeseen consequences and a cascade of interventions to fix the issues, each making things worse. Simplicity is hard to achieve because some people like to appear sophisticated. The author proposes simple heuristics rules of thumb, to deal with complexity. The author realized fragility is defined as a dislike of volatility and randomness. Anti-fragility is the opposite, it likes volatility and benefits from randomness and disorder. Almost everything is either fragile or anti-fragile to certain types of randomness. Studying how things react to volatility has been the author's lifelong work. There are two types of people who work with volatility, academics who study future events and practitioners who try to understand how things react to volatility. Practitioners tend to grasp anti-fragility more intuitively. The extended disorder family includes uncertainty, variability, imperfect knowledge, chance, chaos, volatility, disorder, entropy, time, the unknown, randomness, turmoil, stressors, error, dispersion of outcomes, and unknowledge. Anti-fragile systems benefit from most of these, while they harm fragile systems. Time brings more disorder, errors, and chance events, so anti-fragile systems benefit over time. This book is the author's central work, building on a single core idea taken to its logical endpoint. His other books are like chapters of a more extensive work focusing on decision-making under uncertainty and randomness. Though written at different times, the books tie together cohesively. The author eats his cooking he only writes about things he has personal experience with and only recommends risks he takes himself. Here is a summary of the organization and main ideas in Anti-Fragile by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. The book is divided into seven books that explore different aspects of anti-fragility. The books flow together and build on each other to explore Taleb's central concept of anti-fragility. Book I introduces the concept of anti-fragility. Anti-fragile systems gain from disorder and volatility. Evolution and organic systems are examples of anti-fragile systems. There is a trade-off between the collective's anti-fragility and the individual's fragility. Book 2 argues that modern political and social systems have tried to eliminate volatility and disorder, making society less anti-fragile. This is like harm done by the healer, in trying to help, the healer harms the system by reducing necessary stressors. Book 3 introduces Fat Tony who intuitively understands anti-fragility. The world has an inherent asymmetry, as described by the philosopher Seneca. Book 4 explores how optionality and technology have made the world anti-fragile, not human design or intelligence. Taleb contrasts this with the Soviet Harvard approach of trying to predict and control the world. Fat Tony and Socrates debate how we come to the knowledge that we cannot explain logically. Book V discusses nonlinear relationships and systems. Small inputs can have disproportionate effects. The philosopher's stone is the ability to transform something non-linearly. Its opposite is more fragile. Book V lays out Taleb's ethical rules, including calling out fraud when you see it, only writing about ideas you have thought about for a long time, and exposing those who make society less anti-fragile. Taleb aims for doxastic commitment, beliefs you commit to and will take risks for. Book 7 discusses how to make a system anti-fragile by applying stressors and layering. Some amount of disorder is critical for anti-fragility. The overall themes are distinguishing between fragility, robustness, and anti-fragility, illustrating what makes a system anti-fragile, and cautioning against hubristic interventions that make society less anti-fragile by eliminating necessary stressors and volatility. Anti-fragility requires some disorder and allows for the possibility of gain from unforeseen events. Here is a summary of the key ideas. Along a spectrum, things can be categorized into fragile, robust, and anti-fragile. Fragile things are harmed by volatility. Robust things are indifferent to it, and anti-fragile things benefit from it. Anti-fragility is relative and contextual. Something can be anti-fragile in one domain but fragile in another. For example, a boxer can be physically robust but emotionally fragile. An older woman can be physically fragile but mentally anti-fragile. The golden robust is only sometimes desirable. While anti-fragility is generally preferable, it can be costly in some situations. Moreover, too much robustness is not ideal either one can die from being immortal. Anti-fragility applies to many domains, culture, health, biology, politics, technology, urban planning, economics, decision-making, etc. The triad can analyze and improve things in all these spheres. 
Dead and large centralized systems tend to be fragile. Decentralized systems of autonomous units, like city-states, tend to be anti-fragile. Errors and mistakes should be small, numerous, and reversible, anti-fragile, rather than large and irreversible, fragile. A system of tinkering and trial and error facilitates anti-fragility. Removing unnatural stressors and interventions in medicine is more anti-fragile than adding medications and treatments, which often have unknown side effects. Anti-fragility involves subtraction over addition, and acts of omission over acts of commission. The via negative is about gaining wisdom through subtracting, not adding complexity. Anti-fragility has ethical implications and is linked to distributing fragility fairly. When one party is anti-fragile at the expense of another fragile party, it raises ethical issues. Skin in the game is required to prevent such anti-fragilizing transfers. Three levels of discussion, literary-slash-philosophical, parables, semi-technical, graphs, and highly technical, papers and proofs. The literary level aims to convey the key ideas to a broad audience. The concept of anti-fragility is the opposite of fragility. Fragile things break under stress and pressure. Robust things withstand stress but do not necessarily improve. Anti-fragile things benefit and improve from stress, disorder, and volatility. There is no word for anti-fragility in most languages, so the author uses mythological examples to illustrate the concept. Damocles, represents fragility. Damocles enjoys a lavish banquet but with a sword hanging over his head by a single horsehair that could break at any moment. Phoenix, represents robustness. The phoenix is reborn from the ashes, returning to its initial state after destruction. Hydra, represents anti-fragility. Hydra has many heads, two more grow back when one is cut off. Harm and damage strengthen Hydra. The author argues that we know more intuitively about anti-fragility than we can articulate. Although many languages like a word for anti-fragility and the concept is not formally taught, anti-fragile behaviors and systems have survived throughout human history. As evidence, the author cites research showing that primitive populations without words for many colors can still successfully distinguish between colors. Similarly, ancient texts like Greek and Homeric works had very limited color vocabularies, but people still perceived more colors than they had words for. The word blue did not even exist in ancient Greek as shown by Homer's reference to the wide and dark sea. In summary, the critical traits of anti-fragile systems are, they benefit from disorder, volatility, and turmoil. They become more potent when exposed to stresses and shocks. Damage makes them better. They have more upside potential than downside risk. They take advantage of black swan events and use volatility to their benefit. The concepts of mithridatization and hormesis demonstrate the benefits of exposure to small doses of harmful substances. These concepts show that depriving systems of specific stresses and challenges can be harmful. Humans often fail to recognize ideas and concepts outside of the domains in which they usually encounter them. This is known as domain dependence. For example, someone may understand hormesis in medicine but need help to see how it applies in economics. Alternatively, they may grasp an idea in the abstract but need to recognize it in the real world. Domain dependence leads to superficial judgments and prevents us from recognizing powerful ideas that seem too obvious. This is why anti-fragility is hard to see in many areas of life. We do not expect success and progress to arise from coping with challenges and disorders. An example of domain dependence is how Americans would object to government control of prices for most goods but accept the Federal Reserve controlling interest rates. We need to see the similarity across domains. The author compares domain dependence to someone who can learn new languages but cannot recognize that different words in different languages refer to the same concepts, like house in English and casa in Spanish. We get caught up in surface details and must catch up on the more profound ideas. That covers the essence of the author's points on these topics. Please let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. The author argues that humans have an incomplete understanding of the world due to the constraints of language and thinking. We need to comprehend concepts like anti-fragility and hormesis. The author was unaware of the concept of post-traumatic growth until it was pointed out to him, showing his limited understanding. Innovation comes from trouble and necessity, not comfort and predictability. Ancient wisdom and common sense recognize this, even if modern methods do not. Overreacting to setbacks and difficulties leads to discoveries and progress. Redundancy like having spare capacity or extra components, is key to managing risk in natural and anti-fragile systems. The author sees overcompensation, like becoming more focused in the presence of noise, as a form of redundancy. It allows systems and organisms to withstand additional stress. The author has found that speaking slightly unclearly or inaudibly causes audiences to focus more on understanding. 
this disfluency activates more vigorous mental processes. Likewise, background noise, up to a point, can aid concentration by giving our minds something to filter out actively. The author enjoys writing in cafes, working against resistance. In summary, disorder, volatility, and incomplete understanding are closely related. Pushing through limits in our thinking by recognizing concepts like overcompensation as a form of redundancy can help us gain wisdom. The author sees redundancy, in many forms, as the key to anti-fragility. Our bodies build extra capacity and strength in anticipation of worse outcomes and response to information about potential hazards. This extra capacity can be used opportunistically, even without the hazard materializing. Redundancy and extra capacity should not be considered inefficient but rather an investment. Our bodies are better at assessing risk and discovering probabilities than our intellects. We tend to underestimate the worst-case scenario by basing it on the worst historical events we have experienced or know about. However, the worst events, by definition, exceed what was anticipated. Nature, unlike humans, prepares for what has not happened before. The concept of fitness is imprecise. Adapting to a specific past environment is different from being able to withstand higher intensity stressors. Mathematically modeling selection would suggest overcompensation, not just fitness. The phenomenon of overcompensation in response to stressors and harm appears in many domains, not just biology and fitness. For example, repressing riots and rebellions through force often stirs anger and fuels the movement. Some forms of passionate love also intensify in response to impediments and efforts to quell them. Examples of such anti-fragile love that overreacts to obstacles include the characters Swan and Odette in Proust's novel and the protagonist and his lover in Boutsadi's novel. Their love grows in intensity the more the lovers mistreat and exploit them. Here is a summary of the key ideas. Information has an anti-fragile property, it gains from attempts to harm it. For example, banning or criticizing a book often makes it more popular. Some jobs are fragile to reputational harm and criticism. It is better to avoid these jobs or find ways to become anti-fragile to criticism of them. For example, artists and writers are anti-fragile since criticism and controversy boost their popularity, but corporate executives are fragile. Governments and large companies need to understand the anti-fragile nature of information. Their attempts to control information and public perception often backfire and worsen the situation. For example, press conferences to reassure investors often scare them away. We have benefited most from those who tried but failed to harm us, not those who tried to help us directly. Their actions made us anti-fragile. The essential character in the passage is the author's great-grandfather, a wily politician who managed to stay in power despite many enemies. The author sees him as an example of someone who was anti-fragile to criticism and reputational attacks. The main themes in the passage are, the anti-fragile property of information, how it gains from attempts to control or harm it. The distinction between fragile jobs and roles versus anti-fragile to criticism and reputational harm. Artists in the independently wealthy are anti-fragile, while corporate employees and governments are fragile. The irony is that we gain the most from those who try but fail to harm us, not those who try to help us directly. Their actions make us anti-fragile. Does this help summarize the key ideas and themes? Let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. The biological is both anti-fragile and fragile while inanimate objects like cars and computers are not anti-fragile. They degrade over time and with stress. Some new composite materials, like biological materials, show anti-fragile properties, strengthening under stress. Aging is often misunderstood as an inevitable decline, but much comes from maladjustment to stress and environments. Hunter-gatherers, for example, age much less over their lives. Aging results from a mismatch between one's biology and environment. The world can be divided into the complex and the complicated. Complex systems like society, culture, and markets are organic, interconnected, and hard to understand causally. They are more biological. Complicated systems like machines and engineering contraptions are simpler, with straightforward causes and effects. In complex systems, stressors convey information. The body gets information and adapts through stress, not just through the intellect. Bones get stronger with specific stresses. Skin adapts to sun, calluses, etc. Lack of stress also conveys information, as bones and muscles weaken without use. Complex systems exhibit causal opacity, where causes are hard to determine, and specific events are hard to predict. There are many unseen connections. This makes standard logical analysis and methods less valuable. More information and visibility into the system are needed to understand complex systems. An example is bone health, which Carsandy showed is tied to aging, diabetes, and fertility. 
The relationship between bones and these factors is complex, with no apparent causal direction. Bone loss can contribute to aging and health issues, not just the other way around. The critical distinction is between the complex, organic, and anti-fragile versus the complicated, mechanical, and fragile. Stressors provide essential information and adaptation in complex systems, though in a causally opaque manner. Aging and health are often misunderstood and tied to such complex organic systems. The author argues that depriving systems and organisms of stressors causes fragility. Lack of stress, like weight-bearing exercise, can lead to aging and health issues. The example of the lady who carried heavy jugs her whole life and has excellent health and posture illustrates this. While acute stress followed by recovery is good, chronic low-level stress is harmful. The example of the Chinese water torture, with constant dripping, shows how a lack of recovery can be damaging. How Hercules defeated the Hydra also shows how preventing recovery leads to harm. There are two types of systems, engineered slash non-organic and complex slash organic. Engineered systems can handle equilibrium, but for organic systems, equilibrium means death. They require volatility and randomness to function. Depriving them of this causes harm. The author argues that we are committing crimes against life by trying to eliminate volatility and variation, for example, through widespread antidepressant use. Mood swings and emotions provide intelligence. Eliminating them to achieve an artificial equilibrium goes against human nature. Similarly, reducing variability and differences in children's lives reduces societal variability. Strict control and lack of exposure to stressors hamper development. For example, language is best learned through difficult, stressful communication, not textbooks. The author argues that privilege and technology now prevent this, with experiences being highly engineered. The author coins the term touristification to refer to the removal of uncertainty and randomness from life to increase predictability, comfort, and efficiency. However, this castrates organic systems by depriving them of the randomness they need. What tourism is to adventure, touristification is to live in general. In summary, the critical argument is that a degree of stress, volatility, and randomness is necessary for the health, development, and functioning of complex adaptive systems like humans, society, and the economy. Eliminating these in the quest for equilibrium, comfort, and control causes fragility and harm. Life needs some disorder and difficulty to thrive. Anti-fragility for one part of a system can mean fragility for another part. The fragility of some components is necessary for the overall system to be anti-fragile. For example, restaurants are fragile, but the industry is anti-fragile because restaurants compete and die, leading to improvements. Similarly, the fragility of individual entrepreneurs makes the economy anti-fragile. Anti-fragility through evolution is more complex than simple hormesis, getting stronger from small doses of harm. Evolution leads to anti-fragility through the transfer of benefits across generations. Individual organisms die, but their genes encode information, survive, and change. Evolution exploits randomness and stressors to enhance the fitness of the gene pool, even as individual organisms remain fragile. There is a tension between nature and individual organisms. Organisms eventually die, but they reproduce with genetic changes before dying. Nature is not concerned with individual organisms after they reproduce. The anti-fragility of the system comes through changes at the genetic level, not the survival of individual units. We think too linearly about harm and benefits. Our minds have trouble grasping complicated dose-response relationships like hormesis, where a little stress helps, but too much hurts. We tend to see things as either harmful or helpful. However, anti-fragility is more nuanced operating across layers and time through the informational level of genes. The key idea is that the anti-fragility of the whole comes at the expense of the fragility of the parts. Individuals may sacrifice for the good of the collective, even without realizing it. However, benefits are often transferred to others in the future. Nature prefers randomness and volatility up to a limit because it allows evolution. Complete stability would prevent evolution. Some randomness leads to fitness gains as the fittest organisms survive and reproduce. Occasional mutations also introduce changes that can lead to fitness gains. While extreme shocks can lead to extinction, moderate shocks and disturbances allow evolution to work by weeding out weaker organisms and giving fitter ones a chance to survive and reproduce. Viewing biological systems in terms of populations rather than individuals provides insight into how anti-fragility works. What benefits a population, for example, a species, can come at the expense of individuals. For example, Random mutations may harm individuals but benefit the population by introducing valuable changes. Stresses that kill weaker individuals may strengthen the population overall. There are hierarchies and layers within biological systems. 
A species contains populations of organisms, including populations of cells and intercellular molecules. Processes that strengthen a higher hierarchy level may involve harming a lower level. For example, a species may evolve by dying less fit individuals. Learning from errors is a crucial source of anti-fragility. When systems are fragile, errors and deviations from plans are harmful. When systems are anti-fragile, most errors and deviations provide benefits because they contain information. Rational trial and error approaches use errors as a source of information to converge on solutions eventually. The errors of some can benefit others. When individuals make errors that harm themselves but provide information to others, it introduces anti-fragility at the population or species level, even if not at the individual level. In summary, the fundamental ideas around evolution, populations, hierarchies, learning from errors, and benefiting from the mistakes of others provide insight into how nature introduces anti-fragility. Variability, randomness, and volatility are necessary for evolution and progress, even if they involve harm at lower levels of biological hierarchies. Minor errors and mistakes that do not destroy a system can help prevent more significant disasters. Though tragic, the Titanic disaster and Fukushima nuclear accident led to improvements that made systems safer. Plane crashes often lead to safety improvements that save lives. Sound systems, like aviation, are designed to have minor, independent errors that do not spread. Inadequate systems, like the modern global economy, have errors that spread and compound, making the system fragile. Variability causes both mistakes and adaptations. We can learn from our failures and successes, as well as the mistakes of others. Someone who does not learn from their mistakes and blames external factors is a loser. For a system to evolve and become anti-fragile, its parts must be fragile and exposed to failure. The anti-fragility of the whole requires the fragility and sacrifice of the parts. While this is obvious in ant colonies, individuals and businesses do not want to fail for the greater good. This creates tension between the interests of the whole system and its parts. The economy benefits from overconfident individuals and businesses taking risks if the failures remain small and localized. However, governments often bail out large, failing firms to avoid contagion, which transfers fragility from the system to the weak parts. Nietzsche's saying, what does not kill me makes me stronger, is often misinterpreted. The anti-fragility of a system can come at the expense of its parts, through selection rather than hormesis. Individual fragility and sacrifice may be required for system anti-fragility. In summary, anti-fragile systems can benefit from the small failures of their parts as long as the failures do not spread. However, this creates a tension between the interests of the system and its components. Mistaking the anti-fragility of the whole for that of the parts can be an illusion. Individual sacrifice may be required for system improvement. The author discusses the tension between individual interests and the interests of the collective. In the past, individual interests were largely irrelevant, but with the Enlightenment, individual rights and freedoms became more prominent. However, individual and collective interests are interdependent, individuals need the collective to survive, and the collective comprises individuals. The author uses several examples to illustrate this tension. In nature, species survive by sacrificing individuals. Individuals are fragile source selection can occur, but species are anti-fragile. The author finds this ruthlessness unpleasant. Traditional cultures emphasize the collective over the individual. For example, in the mafia, individuals are expected to sacrifice for the good of the group. Breaking this code is seen as dishonorable. Humans may need to prioritize our interests over those of nature to ensure our survival, even if it means some environmental fragility. However, destroying nature too much may ultimately hurt us. Economies cannot function without some individuals failing or suffering in some way. However, we can provide some social protection and show individuals respect. Entrepreneurship is a risky, heroic activity necessary for economic growth and progress. However, entrepreneurs often get little credit or respect, even though their failures provide valuable information to others. The author proposes instituting a National Entrepreneur Day to show gratitude for the risks entrepreneurs take. In summary, the author grapples with balancing individual and collective well-being. Protecting individuals is essential for humanism and ethics. However, some individual risks and failures are necessary for the functioning and progress of systems and societies. Finding the right balance is challenging but essential. Respect and gratitude for those who sacrifice for the collective good can help reconcile this tension. There are two types of professions, employees like John, predictable and steady income but prone to large shocks that can reduce income to zero. Their risks are hidden. Artisans like George, taxi drivers, prostitutes, etc., volatile income but robust to minor shocks. 
their risks are visible. Thanks to variability, they are continuously adapting and improving. They are open to opportunities and gifts. This makes them anti-fragile. Artificial smoothing of randomness produces fragile systems like John's income. Natural randomness produces anti-fragile systems like George's income. Eliminating small mistakes and variability leads to more significant errors and fragility. Centralized systems resemble John's income, one large entity, the illusion of stability but fragile. Decentralized systems resemble George's income, many small entities, the illusion of variability but robust and anti-fragile. The more variability in a system, the less prone it is to black swans. Switzerland is an example of an anti-fragile system that benefits from shocks in the rest of the world. Lenin used to play chess in the same cafe in Zurich where the author was. Zurich was already a haven back then, with high prices. In summary, this chapter argues that natural randomness leads to anti-fragility while artificial smoothing of randomness leads to fragility. Variability and imperfections are necessary for adaptation and improvement. Vladimir Lenin spent time in Switzerland developing his ideology of a centralized, totalitarian state. The author finds it ironic that Switzerland, which provided shelter to Lenin, is a country without a strong central government. Switzerland has a long history of providing refuge to political exiles, dissidents, and others seeking shelter, from Voltaire to exiled royals and political leaders. Switzerland is also a shelter for financial refugees seeking stability and security for their assets. Despite providing shelter to proponents of big government ideologies, Switzerland has a decentralized government with the most power residing in small, regional cantons. There is no strong central government. This bottom-up system produces stability and security. Bottom-up variations, like the political volatility within local municipalities, do not scale up. The dynamics within a small community differ significantly from those of an entire nation. Small-scale systems allow more biological and social factors to influence behavior, producing more responsibility. Large-scale systems rely more on abstract rules and statistics, enabling irresponsibility. There are psychological and social benefits to small-scale systems. We relate more to individuals and small groups than abstractions like the nation. We are more swayed by vivid examples than statistics. The media focuses on sensational anecdotes rather than proportional risks. Bureaucracies and large governments make decisions based on abstract theories rather than concrete realities. Lobbyists and special interests also have more power to influence large centralized governments than small, local ones. In summary, the author argues that Switzerland's stability and security come from its decentralized, small-scale system of government, not despite the lack of a strong central government but because of it. Bottom-up, small-scale systems have advantages over large-scale systems in producing responsibility practical decision-making, and resistance to manipulation, decentralization and localism foster robustness and anti-fragility. The choice of accord in the Swiss system could seem random, but it helps prevent large-scale errors. Switzerland has a mechanism to manage noise and let it run its course rather than minimize it. Switzerland is a prosperous country but traditionally had a low university education. Its system was based on apprenticeship and craft, not theory. There are two types of randomness, mediocristan with many slight variations that cancel out, and extremistan, with a few extreme events that dominate. Extremistan applies to history, economics, etc. Constraining a mediocristan system can switch it to extremistan. Anti-fragile systems are hurt when deprived of natural variations. Municipal noise applies this, as does sterilizing a child, dictating political stability, price controls, corporation size, etc. in extremistan. The exceptions play a major role. Volatility comes in bursts. Predictability is low, and mistakes are rare but large. Planning fails because the world is too random and unpredictable. The Turkey problem, believing the past will continue indefinitely. The turkey is fed for 1,000 days, confirming that the butcher loves turkeys until Thanksgiving. This is mistaking lack of evidence of harm for evidence of lack of harm. The key is avoiding being the turkey. The Northern Levant, Syria, Lebanon, was prosperous for 12,000 years. It was dominated by traders and agricultural lords, supplying wheat and Roman emperors. Cities were autonomous. After World War I, part went to Syria, and part to Lebanon. Before, under the Ottomans, it was somewhat autonomous but paid taxes, the Ottoman and Roman peace enabled commerce. Governments enforce contracts. The area's prosperity declined after borders were drawn and governments took control. Most government damage is invisible in the form of lost opportunities. Prosperity depends on bottom-up volatility and noise, not top-down design or control. 
Aleppo and other cities in Syria prospered for centuries as semi-independent city-states engaged in trade. Then, a few decades into modern Syria, the Ba'ath Party took control and enforced centralized control and statist policies. This caused Aleppo and other cities to decline rapidly. Many merchants fled Syria to places like New York, California, and Beirut, which were more commerce-friendly. Though disorganized, Lebanon was initially a good option. However, Lebanon's government was too loose, allowing militias to build arms. This led to a civil war in 1975. Even so, today, Lebanon has a higher standard of living than Syria. Centralized nation-states are not new but were rare in history. Empires like Rome and the Ottomans allowed local autonomy and were more stable. Local rulers had de facto power for a long time. In Europe, small states and city-states were standard until recently. Alliances frequently shifted, but the conflict was usually limited. The rise of nation-states led to huge wars with massive casualties. Though violence is decreasing globally, the potential for catastrophic damage from conflict is increasing. The world has never been at higher risk. Looking at past data misses this. Multi-ethnic empires like the Austro-Hungarian Empire were replaced by nation-states after World War I, damaging cities like Vienna that were left divided from their histories. The critical argument is that a system with many small, independent units, like city-states, leads to less severe and concentrated risks than one with a few significant, centralized powers, like nation-states. Local autonomy and messy diversity are more stable and prosperous than forced unity under a strong central government. Tight control and overstabilization lead to fragility and instability. Allowing for small variations and imperfections provides anti-fragility. Preventing small forest fires leads to the accumulation of flammable material and catastrophic fires. Preventing small market fluctuations leads to the accumulation of hidden risks and severe market crashes. Stability could be better for the economy in the long run. Firms become stronger with setbacks and fluctuations, and hidden vulnerabilities build up, leading to crises. A new low in markets indicates a lot more distress to come as those unused to losses panic. Volatile markets have more frequent cleanups and prevent severe collapses. Randomness is necessary to unlock specific systems stuck in perilous situations. With randomness, these systems would succeed. This is illustrated by the metaphor of bird and donkey, which would die of hunger or thirst without a random nudge in one direction. Adding controlled randomness, or noise, can improve some systems functioning through a stochastic resonance mechanism. This allows weak signals to be detected that would otherwise be missed. Simulated annealing uses randomness to help find optimal solutions to complex problems. Randomness aids search processes. Chaotic systems can be stabilized by adding randomness. An experiment showed balls jumping chaotically in response to vibration, then orderly and smoothly responding to random, low-intensity shocks. Politicians and the public need help understanding the benefits of stressors, uncertainty, and randomness. However, these elements have an important role in life and society. The author argues that some level of randomness and volatility is necessary for the proper functioning of systems. Too stable and orderly systems can accumulate risks and become fragile over time. Some level of disorder helps systems adapt to change and prevents the buildup of instability. The author cites several examples to illustrate this point. A thought experiment of a city governed entirely by randomness shows that people ultimately rebel against too much disorder in favor of some stability. However, the opposite, having rulers chosen randomly, may be beneficial as it prevents stagnation and introduces variability into the system. Studies show that randomly selecting some politicians can improve how parliaments function. As distasteful as it is, political assassination historically introduced randomness that allowed new leaders to emerge. The lack of such randomness today results in leaders staying in power longer, which can be detrimental. Ancient divination practices like randomly selecting a passage from Virgil's Aeneid to determine a course of action introduced randomness into decision-making. The author practices a similar heuristic by randomly selecting a dish from a restaurant menu. Wars and conflicts, despite their costs, historically introduced randomness that prevented the buildup of instability. Prolonged peace can allow risks to accumulate unseen. The years of peace before World War I are an example. Artificially suppressing volatility through a foreign policy aimed at stability often backfires and results in greater instability. Examples include U.S. support of repressive regimes in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the Shah of Iran. These policies aimed for short-term stability but resulted in worse outcomes. The author defines modernity as humanity's large-scale control over the environment and suppression of randomness. However, some level of randomness is necessary for robust, adaptable systems. Overall, 
The message is that we must consider second and third order effects and not seek stability for stability's sake alone. Some disorder is necessary to prevent the buildup of more significant risks. Here is a summary of the key ideas. Modernity refers to the post-medieval historical period marked by rationalization, the belief that humans can design society. It encompasses linear science, efficiency, and statistics. Modernity reduces humans to what appears valuable and efficient. Some aspects are beneficial, but many are harmful, like reducing free will and complex systems to simplistic narratives. There is a growing dependence on narratives and the intellectualization of actions. Things are only done if they fit a narrative. In contrast, non-intellectual doers act without needing a narrative. Modernity increased the focus on the sensational over the relevant. In the past, beliefs like religion imparted respect for uncertainty and complex systems. Now the agency is attributed to humans over gods. The rise of the nation-state concentrated on human errors and fiscal irresponsibility. Naive interventionism refers to the urge to intervene and do something even when doing nothing is better. It often causes unforeseen harm, known as iatrogenic. Iatrogenics are the harms caused by intervention and treatment over the benefits. Every medical treatment carries risks of iatrogenic which must be weighed against the benefits. Iatrogenics were highest when modern medicine was gaining prestige but lacked scientific validity. Doctors and hospitals often cause more harm than good. Semmelweis observed that hospitals caused more deaths than home births but was ignored. Medicine has improved but still causes significant iatrogenic, especially from overtreatment, pharma, and medical errors. The long-term harms of misdiagnosing and medicating children are hard to assess but worrisome. In general, naive interventionism and unattributed iatrogenic are byproducts of the modern notion that humans can fully understand and control complex systems with simplistic tools and narratives. However, Complex systems often self-organize in ways beyond human comprehension. Restraint and humility are needed. The agency problem arises when agents, like stockbrokers, doctors, and politicians, have different interests from the principles they should serve, like clients, patients, and citizens. The agents may give advice or take actions that benefit themselves rather than the principles. The concept of first, not harm, primum non nocere acknowledges interventions and policies potential for unintentional harm. This is known as iatrogenic. Iatrogenics exist in many areas, including medicine, economics, education, and politics. There needs to be more awareness of iatrogenic outside of medicine. While we have a word for causing unintended harm, iatrogenic, we lack one for unintentionally helping or benefiting. Some examples would be hackers making systems more robust or harsh critics inadvertently popularizing a book. Socioeconomic systems in the human body are particularly prone to iatrogenic due to low competence and high interventionism. People often view these systems as engineering problems to fix rather than complex adaptive systems. However, social systems are more like organisms than machines. Especially in social sciences, theories are fragile and often divergent or wrong. In contrast, physics theories have become more precise over time. Social science theories should not be relied upon for decision making or risk analysis. A methodology is needed to address the shortcomings and chimeras of social science theories. Two examples of major iatrogenic are Alan Greenspan's attempts to eliminate the business cycle, which led to increased fragility and crisis, and Gordon Brown's centralization of control, which created costly inefficiencies. Minor downturns and failures are necessary to weed out vulnerabilities in a system. Preventing them leads to greater fragility and more severe crises. In summary, Naive intervention and failure to recognize iatrogenic have caused significant unintentional harm. A methodology is needed to identify and address iatrogenic, especially in complex social systems. Allowing for some small failures and downturns can strengthen the overall system. Concentrated power and control tend to increase fragility. The key message is to be cautious about intervention and overpromising outcomes. There is a tendency for professionals across fields to promise more than can be delivered in order to gain business or status. This naive interventionism can often do more harm than good by disrupting natural processes or creating unintended consequences. The author warns against misunderstanding his message as an argument against all intervention. Targeted, well-thought-out intervention is sometimes necessary and beneficial. However, we must be aware of the potential downsides and unintended effects. Over-intervening in some areas can lead to under-intervening in others where action is needed. As a general rule, Limiting the size and speed of systems and processes is an excellent approach to reducing fragility and vulnerability to unexpected events. However, danger and lack of control must keep people engaged and alert. Removing all rules or signs is only advisable in some cases.
The author argues that we need a systematic approach to determine when intervention is appropriate and when to allow natural systems and processes to operate unimpeded. The goal should limit potential large-scale harm and avoid stifling natural anti-fragility where possible. There is an element of deceit in interventionism since it is easier to gain credit for active measures taken rather than for harms avoided by not intervening. However, avoiding or delaying unnecessary intervention and allowing natural processes to play out is often the wiser course of action, even if less visibly heroic. The Fabian procrastination of key figures like Fabius Maximus Cunctator, who stalled Hannibal's forces, exemplifies how delaying action can be the most prudent strategy. The key takeaway is that we must be judicious in determining when to intervene and hold back, even if acting boldly seems more heroic or exciting. A systematic approach balancing fragility reduction and natural anti-fragility will serve us best in the long run. However, this sort of prudent wisdom is often underappreciated. Procrastination allows one to avoid overreaction and filter information effectively. It has ecological wisdom and protects against error and fragility. It is an instinct that has been unjustly pathologized. One should resist calls to cure procrastination and change environments to suit instincts. Forcing unnatural interventions and cures is irrational. There is too much information today, much of which is noise rather than signal. This causes people to overreact to unimportant fluctuations, like the neurotic person. In contrast, the imperturbable person can remain calm and react only when necessary. Access to too much data and information, especially with an increased frequency of consulting, makes it hard to distinguish signal from noise. This causes overreaction, overmedication, and overintervention. Personal doctors, influential people with data monitoring, and frequent information checkers are particularly prone to mistake noise for signal. The higher the noise to signal ratio, the more overreaction. Looking at data more frequently disproportionately exposes one to noise. Confusion needs more clarity in the data, not just people's psychology. In summary, respect the wisdom of procrastination and instincts. Be very wary of environments and systems that force over intervention. Restrict exposure to excess data and information in order to remain imperturbable. Much of the data we observe daily is just noise and randomness, not actual meaningful information or signals. If we look at data hourly, 99.5% is just noise. However, our psychological biases cause us to overreact to all this noise. The media amplifies this by glorifying anecdotes and making us think we understand the world better than we do. This disconnect from reality makes us increasingly fragile. The media should report news proportionately to its significance, not just to fill space. Significant signals, like information critical to survival, can reach us despite the noise. However, too much noise and information confuses us, like consuming too much sugar. The best solution is to focus only on substantial, meaningful changes in data, not small fluctuations. Central planning and intervention often fail and cause harm, like the famine that killed 30 million in China. However, sometimes, a state's incompetence can accidentally help by introducing redundancies and inefficiencies, like how the Soviet Union avoided worse calamities because its inefficient agriculture ensured there was still food production. France is an example of a country that prospered despite a reputation for heavy top-down management by the state. In reality, France was very decentralized for a long time. The nation-state was nominal primarily, and most people did not speak French. France was gradually centralized over time through infrastructure, education, and media. Some argue that France benefited from its early decentralization as much as from later centralization. In summary, much of the data and events we experience daily are insignificant noises, not meaningful signals, but psychological and media biases cause us to overreact to the noise. Attempts to centrally manage societies often fail or cause harm, and decentralization or inefficiencies sometimes help. France prospered from a mix of centralization and decentralization. The key is distinguishing signals from noise. The author attended an economics conference in South Korea in 2009. During the conference, a representative from an international organization presented the organization's economic projections for the next several years. The author became very angry with these projections and reacted harshly during the conference. He argued that the organization and forecasters generally have an atrocious track record of predicting significant events. The author sees forecasting as a harmful product of modernity. Forecasting often does more harm than good yet society continues to demand it and hire forecasters. The author proposed his triad, fragility, robustness, and anti-fragility, as an alternative to forecasting. These concepts do not require as accurate an understanding of the world as fragile systems. The author argues that we take steps to childproof and protect against various dangers, 
but we do not do enough to protect against the harms of forecasters and their overconfidence. Studies have shown that giving people random forecasts can increase their risk-taking. The critical points in the summary are, the author strongly criticized an organization's economic forecast during a conference. The author sees forecasting as generally harmful and inaccurate. The author proposed his triad as an alternative to fragile forecasting. The author argues that we need to do more to protect against the dangers of forecasters and overconfidence in predictions. Studies show that even random forecasts can spur inappropriate risk-taking. Robust and anti-fragile systems require less predictive accuracy than fragile systems. Does this summary accurately reflect the key points and arguments presented in the selected passage? Let me know if you want me to clarify or expand the summary further. Redundancy, like having extra cash in the bank, makes one less predictive since one does not need to know precisely which event might cause trouble. Those without redundancy, who are fragile, must predict much more accurately. One can control fragility more than one realizes by detecting fragility, which is more accessible than predicting events making things robust to defects and forecasting errors rather than trying to eliminate human flaws recognizing that history progresses by turning lemons into lemonade, anti-fragility, rather than blaming the failure to predict events, one should blame building fragile systems. Predicting events is hard, but building robust systems is possible. Certain domains like society, economics, and culture are hard to predict, the black swan domain while physical domains are more predictable. One should separate domains into those where black swan matters and those where they do not. Randomness in the black swan domain is fundamentally hard to measure or predict. Modern life increasingly exposes us to extremes, the extremist and effect, making prediction even harder. We are building things we understand less and less. Some now try to predict black swans with complex models, but the answer is more straightforward. Focus on anti-fragility. The story introduces Nero Tulip, who reads books, and Fat Tony De Benedetto, who reads little but is very perceptive. Despite their differences, they are friends who entertain themselves by detecting fragility in others. Nero and Fat Tony were friends who enjoyed meeting in New York City for lunch. They both hated boredom and empty days. They enjoyed discussing interesting topics during their lunches. Fat Tony was very popular and well-respected in Italian restaurants. The staff and owners celebrated his arrival. He would often receive gifts from them. Nero enjoyed joining Fat Tony for lunch because Fat Tony's popularity meant Nero would get good service and food. Nero had simple tastes. He went to bed early, preferred daylight activities, and enjoyed reading books he ordered online. He belonged to a group that translated ancient texts and attended commemorations of famous Greeks like Plato. Nero was curious about many topics but found that trying to understand topics often led to more questions deeply. His curiosity grew the more he tried to satisfy it. Nero and Fat Tony predicted a crisis would be caused by suckers who were overly confident in their understanding of probability and the economy. Fat Tony thought bankers and nerds were the biggest suckers. He made much money betting against their success. Nero also profited some but was more interested in being proven right. They were anti-fragile because they benefited from instability and crisis. Nero and Fat Tony disagreed on whether or not to warn suckers about their foolishness. Fat Tony thought warning them would lead to ridicule. Nero believed they should be warned first before betting against them. In summary, the friendship between Nero and Fat Tony, their shared love of interesting lunch conversations, and their ability to predict and profit from the crisis are highlighted in this passage. Their opposite approaches to engaging with suckers showed their differing views on responsibility for others' well-being. Seneca was a wealthy Roman philosopher who followed and promoted Stoicism. Stoicism advocated indifference to external events and fate. Seneca focused on the practical aspects of Stoicism, like handling adversity, wealth, suicide, etc. Academics criticized Seneca for not being theoretical or philosophical enough. However, Seneca demonstrated wisdom and practical decision-making. Other philosophers tried to apply theory and practice, often ineffectually. It is better to start as a practitioner rather than a theorist. The story of Professor Triffitt illustrates how some decision theorists focus on complex, and applicable problems rather than practical wisdom. Truffaut was asked to help make a practical decision but needed help to apply his theoretical knowledge. Practice and wisdom are more important than theoretical knowledge alone. Seneca advocated focusing on what you can control and not worrying about what you cannot. Be prepared for turmoil and see it as an opportunity. Do not stay attached to possessions. Seneca's advice can be summarized as, lose nothing or gain nothing. Be indifferent to both loss and gain. Prepare for ups and downs. Another advice is, what to do on your next shipwreck. Prepare for adversity as inevitable. 
stay calm and make the best of the situation. In summary, the key ideas are, practical wisdom and experience are more valuable than theoretical knowledge alone. Prepare for adversity, and do not become too attached to possessions or outcomes. Stay indifferent to both losses and gains. Accept ups and downs with equanimity. See turmoil as an opportunity rather than a threat. Make the best of any situation. The decision to accept a position at Harvard caused the economist much angst, even though it was relatively trivial compared to other difficult life decisions. A colleague suggested using the expected utility theory to decide, but the economist dismissed this approach as not serious enough for such an important choice. In contrast, the Roman philosopher Seneca took such life decisions very seriously. He had survived life-threatening situations and offered practical advice for living well. Unlike the Harvard economist, whose work is read primarily by other academics, Seneca's writings are still read by ordinary people today, thousands of years after his death. Seneca advocated ways to reduce vulnerability to misfortune and gain upside from random events, in other words, anti-fragility. On the surface, Stoicism promotes indifference to fate and material possessions. However, Seneca retained his great wealth, suggesting he valued its benefits by going through mental exercises to detach himself from his possessions. Seneca reduced his worry about losing them. He traveled lightly and could face shipwrecks and other calamities with equanimity. Stoicism aims to domesticate emotions rather than eliminate them. It teaches transforming fear into caution, pain into insight, mistakes into lessons, and desire into purposeful action. Stoic techniques like delaying anger can help avoid hasty actions one may later regret. Investing in virtuous deeds provides inner strength that cannot be taken away. Seneca said wealth serves the wise but rules the foolish. Unlike other Stoics who claimed poverty is preferable to wealth, Seneca benefited from the upside of his circumstances. He argued that one could achieve mastery over emotions and fate. By practicing indifference to outcomes, embracing adversity, and focusing on what one can control, one can gain inner peace in a turbulent world. Overall, Seneca's Stoic philosophy moves beyond robustness to achieve anti-fragility. Here is a summary of the key points. Fragility implies irreversible damage, like a terminal disease. It is path-dependent, meaning the order of events matters, not just the result. The fragile stays fragile. The effective speed of growth depends on fragility. High speed or rapid growth means nothing if there is a high chance of crashing or collapsing. Nominal gains can be wiped out by fragility. GDP growth can mask fragility by loading future generations with debt. Real growth is robust, not fragile. The solution to fragility is the barbell strategy, combining extremes and avoiding the middle. Have extreme risk aversion in some areas and extreme risk loving in others. This reduces downside risk while allowing for upside potential. An example is putting 90% of the money in risky investments and 10% in risky, maximally risky investments. This caps your maximum loss at 10% but allows for huge gains. This avoids the problem of miscalculating the risk of rare, extreme events. The barbell strategy provides aggressiveness plus paranoia. Protect yourself from the extreme downside and let the upside take care of itself. As Seneca showed, reducing the extreme downside, not improving the upside, can provide more upside than downside. The key is that gains and losses are asymmetric. Small losses are tolerable but significant losses can be terminal. Significant gains, on the other hand, can be life-changing positively. The barbell exploits this asymmetry. The main point is that fragility is unforgiving, so the focus should be first and foremost on reducing extremely adverse outcomes and exposures to negative black swans. The upside will then emerge on its own. The barbell strategy combines paranoia about the downside and openness to the upside. The key idea is that barbell strategies that combine extremes while avoiding the middle produce favorable outcomes. A barbell approach involves maximally aggressive slash speculative behavior in one area and maximally conservative behavior in another. This avoids the mediocrity and corruption that comes with the middle ground. Some examples, in mating, females pursue an accountant for stability but also cheat with an alpha male for good genes. This combines security with the upside. In policy making, Protect the very weak but let the strong thrive. Do not prop up the middle class. In literature, get a sinecure for financial security to write freely in your spare time. Do not become an academic. I am incredibly paranoid about risks like smoking or motorcycles, but I take many risks in other areas, like professional life. In investing, be extremely aggressive in some investments but highly conservative in others. Do not take mediocre risks. In exercise, lift hefty weights but also rest entirely. Do not do moderate long workouts. 
The key is maximizing the upside while minimizing the downside by avoiding the middle. Have extremes, but avoid mediocrity. Be aggressive in some areas and paranoid in others. Get stability from one barbell and an upside slash reward from the other. However, stay away from the middle ground. The author discusses Thales, an ancient Greek philosopher, and his ability to utilize optionality. The author says that Aristotle, and most thinkers since, have misunderstood the point of Thales' actions. The author says, intelligence makes you discount anti-fragility and ignore the power of optionality. Thales enjoyed philosophy but needed to make more money as a philosopher. His friends suggested those who can do, those who cannot philosophize. To prove them wrong, Thales used his knowledge to predict that olive pressing equipment would be in high demand during the harvest season. He deposited a small sum to reserve all the olive presses in advance. When the harvest came, he could rent the presses at a high price, making a significant profit. Thales demonstrated the value of optionality, by spending a small amount up front, he allowed himself to benefit from uncertainty and gain a significant upside. His friends failed to understand this and just saw that a philosopher had become wealthy. They accused him of scheming or stealing, not realizing that his knowledge and optionality were the sources of his gains. The author argues that the rational flaneur, someone who makes decisions fluidly based on new information, like Thales, has a significant advantage in life and business. While solid plans and goals are helpful in relationships and morals, trying to lock in complete visions of the future leads to fragility. Optionality and flexibility are vital for benefiting from uncertainty. Overall, the key points are, 1. People often fail to understand anti-fragility and optionality, 2. Optionality provides the ability to gain from uncertainty with limited downside risk, 3. Fluid decision-making based on new information leads to more optionality than rigid plans, 4. Optionality is a crucial driver of growth and innovation. Thales was an ancient Greek philosopher who also engaged in business. He secured the right to use all the olive presses in Miletus and Chios for a low fee before the olive harvest. When there was a significant olive crop and high demand for the presses, Thales could rent them out at a high price and make a good profit. He made enough money to fund his philosophical lifestyle. This story illustrates a fundamental concept of optionality and asymmetry. Thales obtained the right but not the obligation to use the olive presses. This gave him an option that provided a significant potential upside, if there was high demand, and a limited downside, if there were low demand, he would not exercise the option. This is an asymmetry where the potential gains are more significant than the potential losses. Options with a significant upside and limited downside exposure are anti-fragile, they benefit from disorder. The more volatility and uncertainty, the more valuable the option becomes. Thales' option on the olive presses prospered from the volatility and uncertainty around the size of the olive crop and harvest demand. Some other examples of options and asymmetry, having leisure activities or social plans on a Saturday night but not committing to anything specific provides options with limited downside. You can choose the most appealing option or do nothing. Renting a rent-controlled apartment allows one to stay at a low fixed rent or leave for something better. The tenant benefits if rents go up but can leave if rents go down. The landlord is obligated to provide the housing at the fixed rent. This is an asymmetry that benefits the tenant. In summary, optionality and asymmetry, where there are more potential gains than losses, lead to anti-fragility. Options become more valuable with more volatility and uncertainty. Thales and the examples illustrate how to gain from disorder and uncertainty. Authors, artists, and thinkers should have a small number of enthusiastic and influential supporters rather than a large number of mildly appreciative fans. The opinions of detractors do not matter. This is because, in these domains, there is no real downside or loss from a lack of widespread popularity. All that matters is gaining a core base of dedicated supporters. For example, Wittgenstein was considered strange by most but had a cult following of very influential supporters like Bertrand Russell. Work and ideas are generally most robust if many people dislike or oppose them, but a small percentage are extremely loyal supporters. You do not need average or widespread acceptance. Businesses like luxury goods also do not care about average customers or widespread appeal. They only care about a small number of very wealthy customers. They benefit from inequality and dispersion of wealth, not raising average wealth. Summers argued that while men and women may have equal intelligence on average, there is more variability and dispersion among men, with more unintelligent and brilliant men at the extremes. So there are more men in positions that depend on extremes, like science, but also jails and failures. Optionality and the ability to benefit from favorable outcomes, not predictive ability, are most important.
All you need is the wisdom not to hurt yourself by avoiding unintelligent actions and the ability to recognize and gain from favorable outcomes when they happen, not predict them. Evolution shows how extraordinary sophistication and intelligence can emerge without actual intelligence, just from optionality slash trial and error, selection, and randomness. Half of all embryos spontaneously abort, nature selects what works and discards the rest. Nature exploits optionality far better than humans. Optionality depends on asymmetry, more upside than downside, and rationality, ability to select the best option and benefit from it. The fragile have no option, the anti-fragile gain by selecting the best option. We often pay more attention to optionality and asymmetry outside of formal options contracts and insurance where they are explicit. Our minds are domain dependent, so we do not see them in other contexts even though trial and error and model error provide examples of optionality. The author marvels at how long it took humans to put wheels on suitcases, almost 6,000 years after the invention of the wheel, despite our technological sophistication, we put a man on the moon. This shows our lack of imagination in seeing the potential uses of existing inventions. Even brilliant minds at conferences did not think of applying wheels to suitcases, showing how we need more foresight into what will be significant and impactful in the future. We rely on randomness and trial and error, not imagination or intelligence, to make discoveries and progress. Andy fragility is needed. The story of the wheel itself is even more humbling. The Mesoamericans had wheels but only used them for children's toys, not for practical applications like transporting goods. They moved huge stones using immense human labor rather than the wheel. Similarly, the Greeks had the Yalapile, which showed the power of steam, but they only saw it as a toy or novelty not realizing its potential uses. We fail to connect the dots and lack practical wisdom. Theoretically, theoretical scientists and academics must focus more on practical applications. They reward complex, abstract work rather than simple solutions to common problems. Practical knowledge comes from practice, not theories. We must combine stupidity, trial and error, randomness, with wisdom, learning from mistakes and failures, adapting theories to reality. Academics often need more grounding in reality. They lecture birds on how to fly rather than learning from their practical experience. In summary, humans need more imagination, connect ideas across domains, and see the potential future applications of current concepts or technologies. We need a blend of theoretical knowledge and practical wisdom to make progress. More than relying on abstract theories or trial and error is required. The author built an operating model of the Yoli Pile, an ancient steam turbine described by the hero of Alexandria showing how practical innovations can lead to the rediscovery of past theoretical ideas. Discovery and implementation involve an element of chance and evolution. Implementing an idea can be even more complicated than coming up with it in the first place. It requires overcoming obstacles and doubters. The key is recognizing the potential of an idea, its optionality. Some inventions are only half invented until someone envisions how to realize them fully. For example, the computer mouse required Steve Jobs to popularize the graphical user interface. The most straightforward tools, like the wheel, often have the most significant impacts. Technologies frequently regress or disappear, as in the case of the wheel being replaced by camels in the Middle East. Simple, natural solutions win out over complex technological ones. Less is more. There are often substantial gaps between discovery and implementation, as germ theory takes decades to change medical practices. Clinging too old. Misguided theories in the face of new evidence is irrational. However, some delay in adopting new ideas can be prudent. Trial and error is not purely random. It requires rationality to recognize beneficial outcomes, learn from failures, and make progressive improvements. The shipwreck hunter Greg Stem provided an example of controlled randomness, analyzing locations and progressively narrowing down the search. His bad quarters were investments in future discoveries. In summary, Discovery and progress depend on randomness, chance, and evolution as much as rationality. Recognizing the potential of new ideas and having the vision to implement them entirely are crucial to innovation. Simple, natural solutions tend to prevail. Moreover, trial and error, while random, requires intelligence and learning to achieve success. The author discusses probability-based search methods that systematically search space by starting with the highest probability areas and narrowing down to lower probability areas. An example is shipwreck hunting, where hunters start with the areas most likely to contain a shipwreck and search those before moving on to less likely areas. This is like searching your house for a lost item, starting where it will most likely be found. These probability-based search methods apply to domains like oil exploration as well. Unlike shipwrecks, 
oil fields and natural resources have virtually unlimited potential value. The author argues that these search methods are not random but tamed and harvested randomness that leverages optionality. The author critiques Joseph Schumpeter's concept of creative destruction. Schumpeter realized that systems must break down to improve but needed to fully appreciate uncertainty, optionality, or layers of evolutionary tension. Schumpeter and his critics should have noticed how optionality drives growth. The author distinguishes two types of knowledge, one, intuitive, experience-based knowledge that is difficult to express and codify and, do, formal, academic knowledge that can be taught, graded, and theorized. Many need to pay more attention to the importance of the first type of knowledge in human affairs. There needs to be more evidence that the second type of knowledge generates much value. The Soviet Harvard illusion is the mistaken belief that lectures and academic knowledge alone generate real-world skills and progress. An example is professors lecturing birds on how to fly and then taking credit for the bird's ability to fly. In reality, the birds fly due to innate biological abilities, not because of the lectures. However, regarding humans, it is plausible that lectures and academic knowledge drive skills and progress. This illusion is an example of epiphenomena, the mistaken belief that one thing is the cause or driver of another thing when it is correlated with or reflects the other. An example is believing a ship's compass directs the ship's movement rather than just reflecting the direction the ship is already traveling in. Academic theories and models may be epiphenomenal in this way, merely reflecting what practitioners are already doing intuitively rather than directing practice. The author suggests an alternative model where, 1, random tinkering and experimentation lead to, 2, experiential heuristics and skills, which then inform, 3, practice and apprenticeship. This loop then repeats, in parallel. Academic theories develop but largely remain disconnected from practice. Detecting epiphenomena requires examining what happened before the lectures or academic models arose. The author's experience moving from practitioner to researcher revealed the epiphenomenal nature of some academic theories of volatility. There is a causal illusion that academic research generates societal wealth and knowledge. There is merely an epiphenomenon, a correlation where A and B often appear together, leading us to assume that A causes B or vice versa falsely. We can debunk epiphenomena by examining the sequence of events to see which genuinely precedes and influences the other. The philosopher of science Clive Granger proposed a method to determine Granger causation by analyzing the sequence of variable changes. Cherry-picking or confirmation bias is when we selectively report facts that confirm our pre-existing beliefs while ignoring disconfirming evidence. This leads to a distorted perception of reality. For example, Mathematicians tout the successes of mathematics but not its failures or limitations. Similarly, academics promote their methods' usefulness but not their methods' usefulness rather than what they do not accomplish. There is a false equivalence between spending money to build prestigious universities and generating knowledge or progress. Knowledge evolves organically through trial and error and serendipity, not by governments importing entire university systems or prestigious professors. Progress arises from the freedom to explore and make mistakes not by closely following a predetermined path. The analogy of green lumber refers to freshly cut wood that is not yet dried or cured. Just as green lumber will warp and crack as it dries. Initially, ideas and methods that seem appealing or prestigious may need to be revised upon further examination or experience. What matters is how ideas and methods actually function in practice, not how they appear superficially. The key takeaway is that we must apply rigorous critical thinking to question easy assumptions and receive wisdom. Appearances are deceiving, and the truth is often counterintuitive. An idea's practical value depends on how well it functions in the real world rather than how good it looks on paper or prestige. Knowledge evolves through trial and error, not rigidly following a predetermined path. In a few years, members of Abu Dhabi society will benefit from improved technology and infrastructure. However, the belief that a university education necessarily leads to economic growth is more superstition than fact. The author points to Switzerland and his ancestral village of Amun as examples where hardship and adversity, not education, led to success and prosperity. Prosperity came from oil wealth in Abu Dhabi, not vocational skills. The author argues that their spending on education is misguided and sterile. The author questions where the stressors that would drive innovation in Abu Dhabi. He cites many examples of the idea that necessity drives invention and prosperity. Abu Dhabi needs these difficulties and challenges. There is little evidence that education leads to national prosperity. Instead, prosperity leads to a more excellent education. The author cites examples of countries like Taiwan, South Korea, and Sub-Saharan Africa where education levels did not correlate with economic success or failure. 
Education benefits individuals by providing credentials and stability but does not necessarily benefit whole economies. The author argues that we should not expect a simple education in economic growth out relationship. The links between education spending and productivity are complex. Examples like Egypt show that considerable investments in education did not lead to economic growth. The author supports education for other reasons like reducing inequality, increasing opportunity, and improving quality of life. However, education should not be justified based on spurious arguments about economic growth. Real education comes from experience and interactions, not just formal schooling. The author questions the notion that university education generates knowledge and economic growth. Historically, the purpose of education was to cultivate virtue and learning for its own sake, not for economic gain. The idea of educating for economic growth is relatively new. The author argues that entrepreneurs and practitioners are often inarticulate, and their skills do not translate to eloquent conversation. On the other hand, bureaucrats are selected for their polished conversation over their effectiveness. We should not conflate the ability to speak well with other kinds of competence. In summary, the author is skeptical that Abu Dhabi's investment in university education will necessarily lead to greater prosperity. Evidence suggests that the relationship between education and economic growth is complex. The purpose and benefits of education should not be reduced to vocational or economic outcomes alone. Prosperity emerges from adversity and practical experience, not just formal education. Moreover, the ability to converse articulately does not equate to effectiveness in business, entrepreneurship, or governance. Success in finance is subjective and not based on deep knowledge or expertise. Instead, success comes from intuitions developed from experience, even if some of that experience is misguided. The green lumber fallacy refers to the situation where the key insights that lead to success come from unexpected or counterintuitive sources of knowledge. In the author's experience, highly successful foreign exchange traders need a deep knowledge of economics, geopolitics, or mathematics. Instead, their success came from developed intuitions and learning the dynamics of order flow in the market. The author had to deintellectualize himself to understand their insights. Similarly, Fat Tony got rich by betting against the consensus that the Gulf War would lead to higher oil prices. While experts have complex analyses of the geopolitical situation, Fat Tony understood that the war was already priced into the market. His simple insight that Kuwait and oil are not the same things led him to big profits. Success comes from these simple, counterintuitive insights, not complex analyzes. The conflation refers to mistaking one thing for another or assuming a simple causal relationship exists between two complex systems. The author argues that we should be wary of conflating perceptions, theories, or ideas with the complex realities they aim to represent. The relationship between them is often highly complex and non-linear. Success comes from intuiting these complex relationships, not over-intellectualizing the situation. The key takeaway is that real-world success often comes from intuitive, experiential knowledge, even if it seems misguided or counterintuitive. Overly intellectualizing complex situations can lead to missing the forest for the trees and conflating ideas with realities. Simple, intuitive insights into complex systems are the seeds of success and anti-fragility. The author argues against relying on narratives and theories created by experts and intellectuals. He believes these narratives are fragile and can have harmful consequences when applied in practice. Instead, the author favors an empirical, trial-and-error approach that relies on optionality and anti-fragility. Some key points. The author contrasts the Titan brothers Prometheus, the forethinker representing progress, and Epimetheus, the afterthinker representing backward thinking and lack of intelligence. The author associates narratives and theories with Epimetheus while associating optionality and trial and error with Prometheus. The author argues that you cannot predict the future by projecting the past using narratives. The future is uncertain and opaque. The only way to navigate uncertainty is through optionality and trial and error. The author contrasts doing with thinking. Thinking and theories are fragile, while doing and practicing are anti-fragile. Anti-fragility comes from trial and error, not theories. The author argues against relying on expert knowledge and theories. Experts think they know more than they do, making them fragile. It is better to rely on heuristic knowledge embedded in traditions and practices. The author argues that innovation and growth come from anti-fragile risk-taking and trial and error, not education and research. Historians are prone to incorrectly attributing progress to theories and ideas rather than the trial and error of practitioners. The author provides several examples where theories and models fail in practice, including economics, finance, technology, and other fields. Success comes from tinkering and heuristics, not theories. In summary, the author believes progress arises from practice, doing, tinkering, 
trial and error, and optionality, not from theories, narratives, expertise, and intellectualizing. Anti-fragility comes from empiricism, not epistemology. The author argues that in many domains, practice and experimentation precede theory, not the other way around. Theories are often constructed after the fact to explain practices that evolve through trial and error. However, the typical narrative promotes the idea that theories and academic discoveries drive real-world progress. The author shares several examples from his own experience. As an options trader, he saw that traders had developed sophisticated techniques long before academics derived formulas to describe them. Academics then claimed that the formulas enabled the trading strategies, when traders had figured them out through experience. The author and a co-author wrote a paper demonstrating this, but it took years to get published because it challenged the conventional narrative. The author found similar inversions of knowledge in other fields. An engineer showed that jet engine designers used a trial and error process, not theoretical understanding. The field of cybernetics is attributed to Norbert Wiener, but engineers had been developing feedback control systems for years before he articulated their ideas mathematically. The author speculates that geometry and mathematics likely developed because builders and architects were already using them experientially, not the other way around. The sophisticated geometry of ancient structures probably came from craft knowledge, not mathematical theory. The author argues that practice usually comes before theory, we build theories to explain the techniques that evolve in the real world. However, we often get the narrative backwards, believing that theories and academic work drive application progress. In reality, theories are usually the children of real-world problem-solving, not the parents of it. The critical argument is that practical knowledge and experience often develop first, with theoretical explanations following. However, the typical narrative inverts this relationship, giving too much credit to theoretical discoveries and academic work in driving real-world progress. The author believes this narrative arises from the fact that theorists and academics usually record history, even though practitioners are the ones initially creating the knowledge. Before formal mathematics and Euclidean geometry, architects and builders relied primarily on heuristics, empirical methods, and tools to construct buildings. According to historians, few people knew advanced mathematics. However, many medieval buildings still stand today, demonstrating that builders understood materials and structures intuitively. The Romans built impressive aqueducts and structures without much mathematics. A reliance on mathematics and optimization can lead to fragility. The durability of old structures shows that experimentation and practical knowledge can lead to robust designs. Ancient manuals on architecture, like Vitruvius de Architectura, contained little formal geometry and mathematics. Knowledge was transmitted through apprenticeships and master-student relationships rather than through academic theories. The role of academic science and epistemic basis of theoretical knowledge in driving technological progress is overstated. Evidence shows that science has often been tangential, not directly driving most technologies. Optionality and experimentation have been more central. Cooking provides an analogy. It evolved through cultural traditions, heuristics, and trial and error, not scientific theories of chemistry. Recipes represent collaborative, wiki-style experimentation. Cooking schools teach through apprenticeship, not theory. Most technologies resemble cooking more than physics. They evolve in a complex, non-linear fashion through craft, heuristics, and chance discoveries not logical derivations from scientific theories. Medicine also remains largely an apprenticeship field, with some theoretical scientific background. Though basic science has a role to play, it is often in unpredictable, tangential ways. Technologies emerge through self-directed, unforeseeable processes of discovery and chance, not linearly from scientific theories. Examples include the emergence of computers, the internet, and social networks. The Industrial Revolution in England progressed through craft, heuristics, and tinkering, not scientific theories. Some historians argue that a decline in curiosity and willingness to tinker in China experimentally helped stall technological progress there, relative to Europe. An appetite for bricolage and trial and error was vital. So, in summary, the key arguments are, 1. Most technologies and fields of knowledge historically progress through practical heuristics, craft, and chance discovery, not a logical derivation from scientific theories. Two. An experimental spirit of tinkering and bricolage has often been more critical than advanced scientific knowledge. 3. The role of academic science in driving technological change is frequently overstated, and in reality, it has usually been tangential. Technical knowledge and innovation in the 19th and early 20th centuries came from two primary sources, hobbyists and English clergymen, rectors, who had a lot of free time and resources. Many significant contributions came from these groups. 
though their role is underappreciated. Organized science and academia often ignored or appropriated innovations from these groups. Little evidence supports the linear model that academic science leads to technological and economic progress. The Industrial Revolution emerged from existing technologies developed by hobbyists and artisans trying to solve practical problems, not from scientific theory. The steam engine and textile technologies are prime examples. Governments should fund non-teleological tinkering, open-ended experimentation and research, rather than narrowly targeted, goal-oriented research projects. This allows for more optionality and the possibility of serendipitous discoveries. Research funding is best distributed in small amounts across many researchers and projects, one slash n style. This allows for more trials and a higher chance of an extreme payoff, given that research results follow a power law distribution. It is better to be in many small projects than miss an opportunity. Medicine has a more extended history of embracing uncertainty and chance. However, it too could benefit from more open-ended research and a one slash n style of funding across many small trials rather than large targeted projects. Smaller trials allow for more optionality and the possibility of big, uncapped payoffs. The key argument is that governments and large organizations should pursue more open-ended experimentation and distribute research funds broadly in small amounts rather than narrowly targeted, large projects. This one slash n style embracing optionality is the best way to produce innovation. Teleological research, like that by the National Cancer Institute in the 1970s, often fails to produce results compared to serendipitous discoveries. For example, screening 144,000 plant extracts over 20 years yielded no new cancer drugs, while chance discoveries in the 1950s produced major anti-cancer drugs. The private industry develops most new drugs, not public research. NIH found that only three of 46 top-selling drugs stemmed from public funding. Non-teleological research, like for other diseases, often yields cancer treatments. You find what you already need to look for. However, Academia tends to ignore such findings. Some significant discoveries, like chemotherapy, came from unlikely sources, like military accidents, but were initially covered up. Many post war therapies came not from scientific insights but blind chemistry and serendipity. Understanding disease mechanisms rarely leads to new treatments. Theoretical knowledge often reduces new drug discovery. The more drugs available, the more interactions to consider, quickly becoming intractable. We likely underestimate drug interactions. Many drugs find new uses unrelated to their initial purpose, like aspirin. Judah Folkman's idea to restrict tumor blood supply led to macular degeneration treatment. Al-Ghazali's metaphor of the pinch shows that overall processes emerge from many individuals' actions, not central planning. No one fully understands the overall process. Matt Ridley argues that human collaboration, like the market, enables explosive benefits through nonlinear interactions that cannot be predicted or directed. We can only facilitate collaboration and prosperity. Corporations love strategic planning, but there is there needs to be more evidence that it works. It can blind companies to opportunities and lock them into rigid courses of action. Most management theory has proven pseudoscientific. In summary, teleological approaches often fail in complex domains like drug discovery. Serendipity and decentralized collaboration are more productive. Strategic central planning tends to be fruitless or counterproductive. Overall progress emerges in an ad hoc, bottom-up fashion through interactions no one fully comprehends. Most economic theories are detached from evidence and reality. Many successful companies drifted into their business opportunistically rather than following a strategic plan. Examples include Coca-Cola, Tiffany & Damp, Co., Raytheon, Nokia, DuPont, Avon, and Oneida Silversmiths. It is hard to determine a population's average wealth or other attributes by sampling because rare, extreme events like very wealthy individuals, are hard to capture but have a large impact. This is known as the turkey problem. In domains with large positive asymmetry, like venture capital, evidence from the past will underestimate the potential upside because positive rare events are hard to capture in samples. This is the inverse turkey problem. Conversely, in domains with negative asymmetry, like insurance, evidence from the past will underestimate the potential downside because rare adverse events are hard to capture in samples. This demonstrates the classic turkey problem. Theories and methods not accounting for asymmetry will get these problems wrong and distort our understanding. Some examples of Harvard Business School professors making these mistakes are given. Some rules of thumb are, look for optionality, open-ended payoffs are better than closed-ended ones, invest in people, not business plans, and be barbell, have some exposure to both upside and downside.
we have been ungrateful to empiricists and practitioners who have advanced knowledge through trial and error. Compared to rationalist theorists, these people are underappreciated in history. Some were called charlatans, but others made fundamental contributions. They competed with more official doctors and academics. There are two domains of life, the ludic, game-like, with explicit rules, and the ecological, complex, with unknown rules, like real life. Skills acquired in the ludic domain do not necessarily translate to the ecological domain. Classroom learning is ludic and does not necessarily apply to real-world situations. The soccer mom approach to child-rearing suppresses children's natural curiosity and desire to explore. It eliminates trial and error learning and produces students who need help handling ambiguity. Autodidactic learning, in contrast, produces intellectuals who can thrive in the real world. Modern life seeks to eliminate variability and randomness. However, randomness gives life meaning and excitement. Captive animals live longer but less meaningful lives than those in the wild. Similarly, we should focus on metrics of the security and salary. The metrics essay author is skeptical of standardized education because of his experience growing up during the Lebanese Civil War. Despite being first in high school, his father valued autodidactic learning. We should favor ecological, spontaneous learning over ludic, structured education. Randomness and adventure make life worth living. We should avoid overly protecting or structuring children's lives but encourage exploration and self-discovery. The author grew up in Lebanon and attended an elite Jesuit school. His father was the valedictorian of his class but did not overvalue formal education. The author realized from observing his father that being an outstanding student meant needing more certain life understandings. He decided to take a different path, focusing on being an autodidact by reading voraciously outside any curriculum. The author only did the minimum necessary to pass his exams. He figured out that knowledge gained through self-directed learning, driven by curiosity, was more valuable than what was taught in schools. He saw schools as limiting people's learning by forcing them into a narrow set of subjects and authors. In contrast, he read many authors, especially those not in a standard curriculum. He aimed to read 30 to 60 hours a week and kept a log of his reading hours. When the author moved to the U.S. for college, he continued his habit of extensive reading outside his courses and sometimes skipped class. He realized he could write effectively for his exams by using a rich vocabulary and coherent essays even if he only sometimes addressed the official topic or questions directly. His father gave him freedom after he got published as a teenager, only requiring that he not fail out of school. At business school, the author became interested in probability and statistics but felt there were flaws and limitations in what was being taught that the professors glossed over. He could sense the problems but struggled to articulate them. So he read extensively on the topic to gain a deeper understanding. The author was an autodidact who gained knowledge through voracious self-directed reading following his innate curiosity. He saw limits and flaws in standard curricula and teaching, preferring to learn through his broad explorations. His habit of constant reading aimed at gaining life understandings, not just formal education. The author imagines a dialogue between Fat Tony, a probabilistic thinker, and the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates. Socrates was known for questioning people to expose contradictions and inconsistencies in their thinking. In Plato's dialogue Euthyphro, Socrates questions Euthyphro on the meaning of piety, but Euthyphro struggles to provide a satisfactory definition. The author speculates that Fat Tony would have handled Socrates' questioning differently. While Socrates believes one needs to define concepts to understand them, Fat Tony thinks one can understand something intuitively without being able to define it precisely in words. Fat Tony gives the examples of a child drinking their mother's milk and a dog being loyal to its owner as understood without needing strict definitions. Fat Tony argues that humans also have instincts that guide their actions in ways they may not fully comprehend rationally. He questions why Socrates thinks definitions are so important. Fat Tony believes life should not be limited to what can be explained in words. He thinks Socrates' approach of endlessly questioning to find contradictions needs to be revised and more productive. Fat Tony represents a more intuitive way of thinking that Socrates and philosophical tradition underestimate. In summary, the author uses the imagined dialogue to contrast Socrates' rationalist approach focused on logic and definitions with Fat Tony's more intuitive probabilistic thinking. The author argues that Fat Tony's approach is more realistic and practical, while Socrates is limited. The dialogue highlights the differences between these two modes of thinking. Socrates advocated examining our lives and beliefs through questioning and logical reasoning. He believed that an unexamined life is not worth living. However, some criticize Socrates for confusing and harming people by questioning beliefs and habits that worked fine. As Fat Tony argues, some knowledge cannot be expressed in words. 
Questioning traditions and beliefs that people follow without trouble can undermine them. Socrates sought definitions of essential natures rather than just descriptions. He believed you could not know something without knowing its form or essence. Plato argued that that we should start with universals to understand particulars. Friedrich Nietzsche argued against Socrates' belief that existence must be comprehensible through reason. He believed a realm of wisdom might be excluded from logic. What we cannot understand intellectually is not necessarily unintelligent. Nietzsche also disagreed with Socrates' view that knowledge necessarily leads to good. Nietzsche saw human tendencies as reflecting either Apollonian qualities, orderly, rational, or Dionysian ones, primal, chaotic. He believed Greek culture balanced these until Socrates and Euripides emphasized the Apollonian, disrupting this balance. The Dionysian is needed for growth and for creating new possibilities. Other thinkers like Cicero and Seneca also referred to Apollonian and Dionysian forces. Cicero argued that logic cannot find truth in ethics and politics. Seneca saw human tendencies as reflecting Bacchic, Dionysian, strength, like Hercules, and reason, Mercury. Cato the Elder and others criticized Socrates for undermining social foundations by questioning traditions and beliefs that had worked well. Cato valued both freedom and custom, fearing tyranny. He saw Socrates as a babbler who undermined morality. In summary, while Socrates valued questioning beliefs and using reason to examine life, his critics argued that some knowledge and traditions could not be reduced to reason. They saw value in custom, primal forces, and recognizing limits of logic, and believed Socrates undermined these. The author discusses how knowledge and truth are less necessary than exposure and consequences in real-world decision-making. People care more about the payoff and risks of a situation rather than whether something is theoretically true or false. For example, we screen air travelers for weapons even though the probability of any one passenger being a terrorist is extremely low. We do this because we are fragile to terrorist attacks, and the consequences are severe. The author argues that the distinction between a sucker and a non-sucker is more important than the distinction between truth and falsehood. In life, exposure and consequences matter more than theoretical knowledge or beliefs. The payoff from our actions and decisions is more significant than understanding the objective structure of the world. Philosophers focus on truth, but people focus on payoffs, risks, rewards, fragility, and anti-fragility. The author says we make almost all real-life decisions based on the fragility and asymmetry of payoff, not probability or truth. We care about the disproportionate impact of events, not the likelihood of them happening. Probability and confidence levels do not reflect this. A black swan event's impact on you personally is more significant than the event itself. Those who suggest better computation to predict events miss the point, focusing on managing your exposure is better. The author defends unreasonable mavericks and innovative thinkers without academic science or probability. Some dared to live in a world they did not fully understand and enjoy. The author aims to debunk the idea that organized academic research leads to progress. The proponents of this view ignore second-order effects and optionality. A rewritten history of technology would not depend so much on teleological science. In summary, the key ideas are that fragility and payoff asymmetries matter more than truth or probability, exposure is more significant than knowledge, and innovative thinkers who do not rely on rational science should be appreciated. Real-world decision-making depends on these factors more than the academic concepts of truth, confidence levels, or predictive modeling. The author spent years in seclusion researching nonlinear effects and volatility. He wrote a highly technical book on the topic initially rejected by academic reviewers but accepted by industry practitioners. After unwanted media exposure, the author again went into seclusion. He realized the tools he had developed for analyzing nonlinear effects in finance were broadly applicable. Specifically, he recognized how fragility can be detected by examining how systems are impacted by volatility and variability. The author shares an illustrative story of the king who swore to crush his son with a large stone. To fulfill his oath without killing his son, the king cut the stone into small pebbles and pelted him with them. The difference between being hit by a single large stone versus many small stones shows how fragility arises from nonlinear effects. The author presents a simple rule for detecting fragility in systems, examine how the system responds to volatility and variability. The system is fragile if minor disturbances cause disproportionately large impacts, a concave response. The system is anti-fragile if minor disturbances cause small or no impact, a convex response. This rule allows us to measure fragility. In summary, the author refined his understanding of anti-fragility and fragility. Anti-fragile systems benefit from variability, while fragile systems are harmed by it. 
We can detect and measure fragility in systems by analyzing how they respond to volatility. Nonlinearity means the response is not proportional or straightforward. Doubling the dose can lead to much or less than double the effect. This is unlike a linear relationship where doubling the dose leads to precisely doubling the effect. Nonlinear relationships can be convex, curving outward like a smile, or concave, curving inward like a frown. Convex relationships mean increasing intensity leads to increasing benefits or decreasing harm. Concave relationships mean increasing intensity leads to decreasing benefits or increasing harm. Fragile things tend to have concave relationships, meaning increasing intensity of stressors leads to disproportionately more harm. They are harmed more by extreme, infrequent events than the cumulative effect of small frequent events. This is because they have survived many small events, so each additional event does little harm. However, significant events can overwhelm the system. Anti-fragile things tend to have convex relationships, meaning increasing intensity of stressors leads to disproportionately more benefits. They gain more from extreme, infrequent events than the cumulative effect of small frequent events. This is like weight training, where lifting a heavy weight a few times leads to more gain than many repetitions of a lightweight. Black swan events, the unexpected extreme events, harm concave fragile systems the most, the more concave the relationship, the more harm from extreme unexpected events. Examples, traffic demonstrates nonlinearity and concavity. At low levels, adding more cars leads to little change in travel time. But at some point, a slight increase in cars can significantly increase travel time. The system is robust to small perturbations but fragile to large overloads. In summary, fragility and robustness can be detected by analyzing how systems respond to increasing intensities of events or stressors. Concave relationships indicate fragility, while convex relationships indicate anti-fragility. Nonlinearity is critical in both cases. Traffic time increases disproportionately with a slight increase in the number of cars. This example is a convexity effect where a small change leads to a significant impact. Many systems, like airports, highways, etc., are very efficient but fragile since they have little excess capacity. Any disruption leads to significant problems. The response of many systems is nonlinear. A small change can lead to a significant impact, not proportional to the size of the change. Policymakers and those who design systems often do not account for these convexity effects. The scaling effect shows that doubling the exposure to something may lead to more than double the harm. This indicates that the system could be more robust and robust. More is different, as systems get larger, new properties emerge that the individual components do not have. A city is different from a large village. Randomness changes from mediocrist into extremist and recommendations for balanced and regular nutrition may ignore the benefits of variability and episodic deprivation, hormesis. The body's response is nonlinear. Two people can do the same activity for the same time and distance but get different benefits based on how the activity is distributed, for example, walking versus sprinting and resting. Health benefits depend on variability and intensity, not just the average. Small is beautiful is an appealing but often anecdotal idea. Evaluating it requires considering fragility and nonlinearity. Being squeezed with no options and high costs is an example of the downside of small scale. Larger systems may be more fragile but also have more flexibility. An example is the high costs incurred when there are no flight options to get somewhere urgently, showing the potential downside of small is beautiful. Larger airlines may be more prone to delays but offer more routing options. In summary, the key ideas are that nonlinearity, convexity effects, and variability need to be accounted for when evaluating concepts like efficiency, optimization, and scale. Please do so often to avoid fragility. However, a more significant scale also provides benefits like increased flexibility. The impact depends on the specific system and situation. Large size makes one vulnerable to costly errors and unforeseen events, called squeezes, that can incur huge costs. The costs increase disproportionately with size. Owning an elephant as a pet is a bad idea because any squeeze, like a water shortage, would cost more than a smaller pet. Large companies similarly suffer huge costs from squeezes compared to smaller companies. Despite the theoretical benefits of economies of scale, size hurts companies during difficult times. Mergers between companies often need to work out because size introduces fragility. The story of Jérôme Curville, a rogue trader at Société Générale, illustrates this. His huge unauthorized trades cost the bank billions when discovered. The loss would have been minor if there had been several smaller banks with small rogue traders. Projects also suffer substantial cost overruns as they increase in size, especially those that cannot be broken into smaller components, like bridges, tunnels, and dams. 
Road projects, which can be done in segments, do not show this effect. Large stores or corporations that fail can devastate neighborhoods. It is short-sighted to only consider the benefits of large entities without accounting for the possibility of their failure. Another example is exiting a crowded movie theater. The crush and chaos are exponentially worse with more people, showing the fragility that comes with increased scale. Contemporary life has optimized for large-scale areas like resource management and food supply chains. This makes us vulnerable to disruptions and price spikes. In travel, uncertainty is undesirable, especially for those on schedules. Delays are more painful than early arrivals of the same duration because they have cascading effects. Planning for longer flight times builds in buffers that address this asymmetry. In summary, scale and size introduce fragility in complex systems. Unforeseen events have costs that increase exponentially with scale. It is wise to consider fragility and built-in buffers when planning large-scale operations. The author sometimes arrives early to destinations, usually only by a few minutes. But there are also instances where the author has arrived hours or even days late. This asymmetry, where delays are often much longer than early arrivals, is common for travel and partly due to time's irreversibility and increasing disorder. This concept also applies to projects. When uncertainty is added to projects, like travel, they tend to take longer and cost more, not less. This is often blamed on psychological biases like overconfidence and the planning fallacy. However, similar biases existed in the past, yet many ambitious projects were completed on time. The critical difference is that the past had more straightforward, linear economies with less complexity and interdependence. Today's world is increasingly non-linear, complex, and prone to black swan events. Even minor errors can have cascading, explosive effects. Information technology projects are particularly prone to substantial cost overruns and delays. The logic behind this is simple. Errors and uncertainty add time to the end of projects but do not reduce time. If uncertainty were linear, we would see some projects finish exceptionally early, which is rare. Wars and government projects also routinely face massive cost overruns for the same reasons. Complexity and asymmetry mean that errors lead to costs multiplying, not reducing. Due to these effects, the costs of wars and the U.S. deficit have swelled far beyond early estimates. The author argues that governments should only be trusted with large-scale decisions or finances if they chronically underestimate costs. Increasing efficiency often means increasing fragility by relying on complex systems like computers that can fail catastrophically. Stock market crashes, nuclear disasters and environmental harms are examples of the high costs of errors in complex systems. To manage environmental risks like pollution, it is best to diversify into many small sources rather than rely on a single significant source due to the non-linear harm of large amounts. Ancestral humans tended to naturally diversify their resource use, unlike today, where we concentrate consumption on a few items. In summary, the key ideas are that uncertainty and errors tend to multiply in complex, non-linear systems and have cascading effects, leading to substantial unintended costs and consequences. This explains why so many ambitious modern projects end up delayed and over budget, why governments chronically run enormous deficits, why the costs of disasters are rising, and why it is best to build redundancy and diversity into systems rather than maximum efficiency. The author describes a technique to detect fragility, which he calls the inverse philosopher's stone. The key is to look for nonlinear effects that accelerate harm. He illustrates this with the example of Fannie Mae, a large mortgage company. By looking at their internal risk reports, he noticed that small increases in economic variables led to significant losses, while small decreases led to small profits. The damage accelerated in one direction, a sign of fragility. Based on this, he predicted Fannie Mae would eventually collapse, though it took time. The technique involves checking if miscalculations or errors accelerate harm in a nonlinear fashion. For example, if a 10% increase in traffic leads to 10 extra minutes of delay, but another 10% increase leads to 30 extra minutes, that shows fragility. The same applies to government deficits, financial leverage, and operational leverage. In summary, the technique looks for convexity, which accelerates harm, rather than just measuring risk. The author suggested that institutions like the IMF could use this technique IMF to assess fragility. The critical signal is when damage accelerates in one direction like in the story of the king dropping stones of increasing weight. That level of fragility means the system cannot handle significant shocks or deviations. The author realized this technique for assessing fragility could apply broadly, not just in economics but also medicine, technology, and other areas where decisions are made under uncertainty. However, the demand for the technique was most significant in economics, 
leading him to propose it to the IMF. That covers the essence of the author's description of detecting fragility by looking for nonlinear, convex effects that accelerate harm. The key is that fragility arises from nonlinear relationships, not just linear risk measures. By identifying convexity, we can spot systems with trouble handling extremes. The author and his friend Raphael Duati expressed a simple idea related to risk assessment using complex mathematics to make it seem more severe and rigorous. Though the math could have added more rigor, people took the idea more seriously because of the complex presentation. The author distinguishes between two types of errors, execution errors, random errors that balance over time and do not significantly impact. These errors increase variance, but the outcomes remain neutral. They can be controlled by making many small transactions. Model errors, errors related to fragile things with adverse convexity effects. These errors tend to have one-sided adverse outcomes. They lead to underestimating randomness and harm. If there is as much variation one way as the other, the harm outweighs the benefit. The author proposes classifying things into three groups based on their response to disturbances, things that benefit from disturbances in the long run. For example, evolution, discovery, things that are neutral to disturbances, things that are harmed by disturbances. For example, traffic, deficit estimation, the author gives an example of how looking at averages can be misleading. Knowing the average temperature your grandmother will experience over two hours tells you little about her well-being if she spends one hour at zero degrees Fahrenheit and one hour at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Her health is fragile to temperature variations, so the dispersion of temperatures matters more than the average. The more nonlinear a response the less relevant the average becomes and the more relevant stability around the average is. The author believes understanding optionality and nonlinearity can provide insights similar to the philosopher's stone, including the severity of conflating concepts like the price of oil and geopolitics. Why does anything with optionality have a long-term advantage, and how can it be measured? Jensen's inequality, a nonlinear function of a random variable will not have the same expected value as the variable itself. The author gives an example of cars and traffic time. Traffic will be terrible if there are 90,000 cars one hour and 110,000 cars the next hour, averaging 100,000 cars. However, traffic will be fine if there are 100,000 cars each hour. The number of cars is the variable and traffic time is a nonlinear function of the variable. The more nonlinear the function, the more the function outcome diverges from the variable. The via negativa, or negative way focuses on what something is not rather than what it is. We can gain insight into complex ideas and systems by eliminating what they are not. The method of via negativa is proper when we have no direct way to describe or fully grasp something, as with many powerful and important concepts. We can approach understanding by systematically eliminating incorrect or incomplete definitions and ideas. The example of Michelangelo carving David by removing everything that was not David illustrates the logic behind the negative. We can create or reveal something by paring away the excess material around it. The interventionist approach focuses on actively doing and implementing positive actions. In contrast, the via negative approach focuses on eliminating incorrect ideas and not doing specific harmful actions. Acts of omission or not doing something are often overlooked but can be just as important. Charlatans can be recognized because they only provide positive advice and recipes for success that seem obvious but are ultimately ephemeral. The via negativa approach avoids this by removing incorrect ideas rather than force-fitting positive ones. In summary, the via negativa approach can lead to deeper understanding and better outcomes by eliminating harmful assumptions and fragilities rather than forcing superficial positive interventions. It recognizes that not acting can sometimes be superior to hasty action. This approach of subtracting to add has been used for centuries and has many practical applications. In many domains, success comes more from avoiding losses than seeking gains. Evolution selects those who avoid harm. Rich people get rich by not going broke. Religions focus on prohibitions. Life's lessons are about what to avoid. We reduce risks by a few key measures. It is hard to tell if a successful person has skill or luck, but we can predict that an unskilled person will eventually fail. Knowledge grows more by subtraction, removing false ideas, than by addition. We know more about what is wrong than right. Negative knowledge is more robust. One observation can disprove a theory, millions hardly confirm it. Failure and disconfirmation are more informative than success and confirmation. Examples of negative knowledge, black swans disprove all swans are white, incompetent surgeons will likely harm patients, bad political leaders should be removed. Classical wisdom extols the benefits of avoiding ignorant people and saying no to distractions. Less is more.
more straightforward methods can work better than complicated ones. Focusing on extremes and avoiding black swans can simplify life. The Pareto principle shows that a small portion of causes leads to a high portion of effects, for good and evil. Modifying a small part of a system can have a significant impact. Examples, a small portion of homeless people incurs high costs, a few problems employees corrupt company culture. A few customers drive the most revenue. Most internet traffic comes from a tiny fraction of sites. Most book sales come from a tiny fraction of authors. A small part of healthcare spending goes to the sickest patients. Managing black swans can have an outsized impact. In summary, negatively focused, simplified approaches that address extreme outliers can have a disproportionately large impact. Success comes more from avoiding harm than seeking gains. Knowledge progresses through disproving false ideas over confirming theories. Moreover, less can be more when it comes to problem solving. The key idea is that most cost overruns in large corporations are due to complex technology projects. Instead of writing long reports and gathering lots of data, focusing on the core, central issues, the pebbles in your shoe are better. Some domains like real estate can be summarized by simple rules of thumb, like location, location, location. We have more data today but have less predictability. More data does not necessarily lead to better solutions and can distract from the main issues. Statistical evidence and complicated models in economics and political science have not yielded substantial results. In contrast, more straightforward but confident fields like physics have been more successful without relying on statistics. Experiments show that people who focus on extraneous details tend to miss important events right before them. Applying less is more to decision-making suggests that you probably should not do it if you need more than one reason to do something. Obvious, robust decisions only require a single reason. Likewise, people or ideas that require multiple, complicated arguments to support them are not convincing or worthwhile. It is better to be known for one central idea or contribution than for publishing many papers or receiving many accolades. Indeed innovative ideas and discoveries come from subtraction, not addition. They remove the unnecessary and leave the essential. The key to prediction and prophecy is the notion of fragility. What is fragile will break down over time, while the anti-fragile will persist or even strengthen. The old tend to survive while the new fades away. This is contrary to the common belief in innovation and progress. The best way to predict the future is to figure out what is fragile and likely to break, not to imagine what exciting new technologies may appear. Positive surprises are more challenging to foresee than negative ones. Time destroys everything, even the most solid things, but at different rates. The fragile will break down fastest. By understanding fragility, we can foresee what will vanish in the future. New technologies may emerge, but the specific ones we envision likely will only last for a while. The genuinely lasting and anti-fragile technologies are nearly impossible to predict. In summary, the key to solving cost overruns, effective decision-making, prediction, and managing technology projects is to focus on fragility, figure out what is most prone to break and eliminate it. Do not focus on massive data, statistics, or complicated models and arguments. Look for what is simple, essential, and has stood the test of time. The old is often more robust than the new. This via negativa approach of subtraction and elimination can be far more effective than addition and accumulation. Our predictions and forecasts about the future tend to underestimate the impact of unpredictable, high-impact events, so-called black swans. Those who do not account for black swans will likely not survive in the long run. Paradoxically, long-term predictions can be more reliable than short-term ones. While short-term errors compound over time, black swan events eventually get incorporated into long-term expectations. However, due to non-linearity and unforeseen factors, most typical predictions become less accurate over longer time horizons. Futuristic predictions and forecasts from the past century must be more accurate. They fail to predict many technologies and tools that now dominate the world. More importantly, the world today looks very different from what was imagined. There is a tendency for Germania, an obsession with the new and modern. Simple, existing technologies and tools used for thousands of years still dominate our lives. Things like chairs, glasses, knives, and transportation have remained the same. However, we continue to imagine a future of radical technological shifts. We overestimate the impact of new technologies and underestimate the persistence of the old. To better understand the future, we need an appreciation of history and the wisdom of past thinkers, the elders. An exclusively engineering mindset focused on the newest technologies and lacking historical context is limited in its ability to forecast the future. The past, not the present, is the best teacher of future properties. 
Technology is most beneficial when it is invisible or displaces existing technologies that are deleterious, unnatural, and fragile. Modern tools like the Internet have disrupted and replaced more harmful technologies, tools, and power structures that prevailed in the 20th century. At its best, technology simplifies and improves our lives in subtle ways. It reverses the adverse effects of technology and cancels itself out. The author discusses the concept of the Lindy effect, which suggests that non-perishable technologies and ideas that have been around for a long time are likely to persist longer into the future. The longer something has survived, the longer it is expected to continue surviving. This is in contrast to perishable things like humans, where life expectancy decreases over time. The author argues that we should not assume new technologies are inherently better or will necessarily replace older technologies and ideas. Things that have stood the test of time are more likely to continue to endure. Many futurists and technologists falsely believe that adopting new technologies makes one seem more youthful or forward-thinking. However, new means something other than better or more likely to succeed in the long run. The old and established is often more robust. Much technological progress comes from building on or recombining old ideas rather than creating new ones. The new is fragile, while the old is more proven and resilient. The author gives examples of technologies like landline phones, print newspapers, and paper receipts that some futurists argue are dying but continue to persist. He argues that we should refrain from making predictions about the demise of any technology, especially well-established ones. While the young often propose new and radical changes, most new ideas must be more robust and impermanent. The contributions of the old and established are more lasting. The author argues that we should not assume the young inherently have the key to the future or better ideas. Progress often comes from a combination of proven ideas, not throwing out the old for the new. In summary, the author argues that we should respect and value what is old and has endured, applying the Lindy effect. The new is not inherently better and often does not replace the old. We should be skeptical of futurists arguing otherwise. What has stood the test of time is likely to continue to endure into the future. The enduring and established, not the new, should be the foundation of progress. Here is a summary of the key points. Karl Popper warned against the error of historicism, the mistaken belief that historical events are predetermined or inevitable. The author suggests reading classics to avoid this error since the past informs the future. We are prone to mental biases like the fooled by randomness effect. We tend only to see successes rather than failures, leading us to overestimate our chances of success in risky endeavors like finance or writing novels. We confuse necessary and sufficient causes, thinking that because some technologies have apparent benefits, all such technologies will succeed. We notice changes more than statics. This leads us to overvalue new technologies relative to existing ones that actually play a larger role. Most innovations and new technologies fail, just like most books. We suffer from Romania, an excessive enthusiasm for new things. When we see a newer version of familiar technology, we perceive it as vastly superior, even if the changes are minor. This causes us to tire of and want to upgrade from technologies we previously enjoyed. These treadmill effects cause dissatisfaction as we rapidly adapt to new things. We do not exhibit the exact Romanian and treadmill effects with classical or traditional goods like art, antiques, or artisanal goods. We focus more on variations between versions of electronic goods but on similarities between electronic and non-electronic goods. Architecture demonstrates an irreversible top-down effect. Mistakes in urban planning tend to persist, whereas bottom-up organic development allows for gradual change. Top-down architecture also lacks the fractal, self-similar quality of bottom-up architecture. In summary, the author warns us against historicism, mental biases, Romania, and irreversible top-down planning using examples from technology, psychology, architecture, and more. The remedy is an appreciation of history, classics, and bottom-up organic development. Fractals are self-similar patterns that repeat at multiple scales. They are jagged and complex, unlike smooth Euclidean shapes. Natural objects like trees, rivers, and mountains are fractal. Modern architecture and design are smooth, simple and lack the complexity of natural fractal shapes. Some exceptions are go these buildings and writing spaces facing nature. Smooth, artificial environments can feel lifeless and cause stress. Many criticize the modernist designs of architects like Le Corbusier and urban planners like Robert Moses. Their large, unadorned buildings and roadways disrupted traditional neighborhoods. Jane Jacobs fought against these designs in favor of pedestrian-friendly cities. Although some modern architecture could be more appealing, large windows and open spaces can provide views of nature. Modern materials have allowed more large windows, 
reversing past trends of small windows for insulation. There is criticism of the metrification system imposed by governments to replace traditional units of measurement. Although the metric system is rational, traditional units like feet, miles, and pounds are intuitive, matching human scales and experiences. They emerged naturally in human cultures rather than by design. The metric system from the French Revolution exemplifies utopian thinking that does not match human nature. In summary, there is value in traditional, fractal designs that emerge from a human experience rather than simplistic, smooth modernist designs imposed by centralized planning. A balance of modern technology with traditional intuitions about scale and aesthetics is ideal. The author proposes applying the notions of fragility and robustness to filter information. Fragile information does not stand the test of time, whereas robust information does. Following the Lindy effect, the author prefers to read older books and papers that have survived rather than recent hyped work. Much modern academic work is like journalism, focusing on attention-seeking and hype. Prizes for promising young scientists under 40 are generally a reverse indicator of actual value or breakthrough work. Real breakthroughs often take time to be recognized and validated. Conversations with amateur philosophers or lifelong teachers are often more worthwhile than recent academic papers. When asked for a reading rule, the author recommended reading as little as possible from the last 20 years, except for recent history books. Recent work quickly becomes obsolete, whereas older foundational texts have lasting value. When asked by the economist who imagined the world in 2036, the author predicted that robust technologies and institutions that have been around for at least 25 years, like books, telephones, artisans, city-states, and small corporations, would likely persist. However, large, optimized institutions that rely heavily on technology and the scientific method, like large corporations, nation-states, and economics departments, would likely weaken or disappear to be replaced by other fragile entities. The classical role of prophets was not necessarily to predict the future but to warn people in the present, based on current vulnerabilities, about what not to do to avoid potential calamities. The Semitic word for prophet, by, meant someone who communicated God's warnings and news to his subjects. Prophets helped protect against idolatry and enemies that might bring harm. The history of medicine shows the relationship between theory and practice and how to make decisions despite a lack of knowledge. Ancient philosophers and doctors were often the same people. Medicine was seen as a branch of philosophy and wisdom. Simple decision rules emerge, mainly use medical techniques only when the benefits outweigh the potential harms, such as life-saving treatments like surgery or antibiotics. Otherwise, the potential downsides often exceed the benefits, especially for comfort treatments. This follows the concept of via negativa, remove what is unnatural. This approach is based on payoffs, not knowledge, Thalesian, not Aristotelian. It leads to positive asymmetries and less fragility. When benefits seem small, there is a significant chance of making mistakes, a sucker problem. There is a link between nonlinearity, opacity, and sucker problems. More significant nonlinearity and less understanding of cause and effect, more opacity, mean a higher chance of fragility from interventions. Small benefits do not justify fragilizing interventions. Evidence based medicine arose to address the need for more understanding, but it has issues. It relies on flawed models of cause and effect, evidence that is not evidence, and interventions that can backfire or have unforeseen effects. Real-world practice is more complex than models. The precautionary principle suggests avoiding interventions that could cause harm, even without evidence of harm. But it does not apply to dynamically complex systems. One cannot be precautionary enough, preventive measures may lead to fragility. The solution is intelligently applied via negativa. Convexity effects mean small probabilities of extremes can dominate, as with disorders following power laws. Medicine needs to consider extremes and nonlinearities, not just manage expectations. The potential for black swans, highly consequential but unlikely events, means we must avoid systemic fragility and sucker problems. The key takeaway is that in the face of opacity and nonlinearity, medicine should do no harm, avoid fragilizing interventions when benefits seem small. Consider extremes not just means, and apply via negativa, the removal of unnatural and harmful elements. Simple decision rules based on payoffs, not theoretical knowledge, can help address the complex realities medicine faces. Exposure or dose response, iatrogenic harm is often nonlinear. Small doses or exposures may have slight benefits but disproportionately large harms. The harms are often delayed, hidden, or hard to detect. This is a manifestation of negative convexity. Fragility slash anti-fragility. Many medical interventions make us more fragile by disrupting natural homeostasis, adaptation, 
and variability mechanisms. Reducing fever, icing injuries, and replacing natural fats with artificial trans fats are some examples. These interventions have small visible benefits but high hidden costs. Natural mechanisms have been shaped by evolution to make us anti-fragile and should not be disrupted without evidence. The burden of evidence, the burden of evidence should be on doctors and medical interventions to prove their benefits, not on the natural mechanisms to prove their safety. Absence of evidence of harm is not evidence of absence of harm. Naive empiricism focuses on past evidence of benefits but ignores the future potential for harm. Rigorous empiricism considers both and puts a higher burden of evidence for unnatural interventions. Nonlinearity in response, the benefits of medical interventions tend to be small for mildly ill patients but prominent for severely ill patients, convexity. However, the harms tend to be constant across the severity of illness. Therefore, medical interventions should focus on severely ill patients where the benefit-harm trade-off is most favorable. The risks outweigh the benefits for mildly ill patients, and it is best to avoid treatment. Epistemological rules. We must distinguish between absence of evidence and evidence of absence. Education and intelligence do not prevent logical fallacies like mistaking one for the other. Under complex non-linear systems, long time intervals are needed to establish evidence. Non-natural interventions require more evidence than natural ones. Evidence should consider fragility, anti-fragility, and evolution. In summary, the ideas revolve around non-linearity, convexity, fragility, anti-fragility, and stringent rules for evidence that consider these concepts. The examples from medicine illustrate the application of these ideas, but the concepts themselves are general. The author is skeptical of performance-enhancing drugs or treatments with only benefits and no downsides. In reality, hidden risks or costs often become apparent later. These are known as suckers' trades, they seem too good to be true. There are statistical reasons why unambiguously beneficial and risk-free drugs are unlikely to exist. Severe medical conditions are rare so nature is less likely to have developed solutions for them. Mild conditions are common, so any drug targeting them is more likely to have unforeseen side effects. The medical community underestimates or ignores these non-linear relationships and hidden risks. They often assume risks increase linearly with dosage, when in reality the relationship is convex, risks accelerate sharply past a certain threshold. Pharmaceutical companies also have incentives to market drugs to increasingly healthy populations, not just those with severe needs. An example is mechanical ventilators, which used to provide constant pressure and volume. However, lungs respond non-linearly to pressure, and constant high pressure causes harm. Varying the pressure, with occasional spikes, allows for greater volume and improved outcomes. Human lungs naturally experience variation, not constancy. Many past medical interventions, like radiation for benign conditions, caused unforeseen harm that was buried and not systematically addressed. We fail to learn from these mistakes and continue demonstrating intervention bias and naive rationalism. Examples include statins, which are overprescribed for people unlikely to benefit and may cause hidden long-term harm, cancer screening, which often leads to overtreatment due to legal incentives, and surgery, which has been relatively successful because the risks and benefits are more immediately visible. In summary, the author argues that we should be more skeptical of medical interventions for mild or ambiguous conditions, recognize the non-linearity of risks, and avoid naive rationalism that assumes any downsides will be quickly apparent and addressed. We need to consider how nature and evolution have shaped human physiology. Medical doctors and surgeons were historically separate professions. Doctors were more theoretical while surgeons relied more on experience and craft. Surgery has become more scientifically based recently due to advances like anesthesia. Many medical interventions once thought to progress have become useless or harmful like certain back surgeries, antibiotic overuse, and excessive hygiene. The author lists many examples of iatrogenics, or harm caused by medical treatment. The author argues that we should be cautious about intervening in complex systems, we need to understand, like biology, fully. Even well-intentioned actions can have unforeseen consequences, like the development of antibiotic resistance. The author uses the example of artificial life creation to illustrate his point. While he respects the scientists involved, he believes that giving humans the power to create life is dangerous because we need a better track record of understanding risks in complex systems. Evolution emerges robustly and undirectedly, while human interventions often have unforeseen adverse effects due to our limited understanding. The author proposes a rule that what Mother Nature does is rigorous until proven otherwise, what humans and science do is flawed until proven otherwise. Nature has an immense track record of surviving unexpected events, so overriding natural processes requires strong evidence. 
we should not give humans explosive toys like the ability to create artificial life when we do not fully grasp the risks. In summary, the author argues for caution and humility in intervening in natural systems we do not fully understand. We need a better track record of anticipating risks and unintended consequences in complex domains like biology. Therefore, we should make changes slowly and deliberately, with solid evidence to support overriding natural processes. Natural selection emerges in a robust way to withstand unexpected events, while human innovations often lack this quality. The key ideas are, we should rely more on empirical evidence, phenomenology, than theories to make decisions. Theories come and go but empirical evidence persists. For example, specific diets work for weight loss regardless of the theories used to explain them. The brain is prone to be convinced by explanations referencing neurosads, even if the explanations are nonsensical. We tend to be duped by theories. Medicine has traditionally been split into three schools of thought, rationalists who rely on theories, skeptical empiricists who avoid theories and rely on evidence, and Methodists who use simple heuristics and are practical. The author argues that we should rely more on the skeptical empiricist approach. Doctors have traditionally been the target of jokes about how they often do more harm than good, iatrogenics. There are many historical examples of this view. An example is a doctor wanting to prescribe blood pressure medication after one high reading, even though the author's blood pressure is usually low. This shows how variability and randomness can be mistaken for accurate information, leading to unnecessary intervention. If doctors always prescribed medication when a patient's blood pressure was above average, half the normal population would be on medication. In summary, the key message is that we should be skeptical of theories and explanations, rely more on empirical evidence, and be wary of iatrogenics and unnecessary interventions due to a failure to account for randomness and variability. A green lumber problem exists in biology, meaning we don't have a good understanding, and there is too much randomness relative to our knowledge. The skeptical empiricist tradition provides a sound philosophical grounding. The author argues that increased life expectancy is not solely due to medical advances. While medicine has contributed to longevity in some cases, especially in complex, life-threatening situations, it has also reduced life expectancy in other cases, specifically in concave cases where the harm from intervention outweighs the benefits. Several factors have contributed to increased life expectancy, sanitation, hygiene, and public health measures development of antibiotics like penicillin the decline in lethal violence and crime advancements in surgery for life-threatening conditions however, we must also account for harms, like, diseases of civilization, for example heart disease, cancer, diabetes, harm from behaviors like smoking studies suggest medical care may only contribute a small number of additional years. Cancer doctors likely help in severe, curable cases, but interventionist primary care doctors likely reduce life expectancy in some concave cases. Data from hospital strikes where elective surgeries were postponed suggests that life expectancy did not drop or even increase. Many elective surgeries were ultimately cancelled, suggesting they were unnecessary. The author argues that we cannot say increased life expectancy is solely or primarily due to medicine and technology. We must consider the harms and benefits and account for the effects of diseases of civilization and unhealthy behaviors. While medicine helps in some life-threatening cases, especially for severe diseases, it also reduces life expectancy in concave cases where intervention does more harm than good. In summary, the central arguments are life expectancy has increased for many reasons. Not just medicine we must consider harms as well as benefits of medicine and technology the medicine helps in some severe, life-threatening cases but hurts in some concave cases studies suggest medicine may only contribute a small gain to life expectancy we should not assume that all medicine and technology unconditionally help us live longer, healthier lives. A balanced perspective considering both benefits and drawbacks is needed. Moderation and prudent restraint may be warranted. The author argues that many life expectancy gains attributed to doctors and medicine result from societal factors. As evidence, the author points out that most deaths historically came from childhood mortality, not a lack of health care for adults. The author also cites studies showing that medical interventions, like yearly mammograms for women over 40, do not increase life expectancy. The harms from overtreatment, in some cases, outweigh the benefits. The author recommends an approach of via negativa or subtraction. Reducing medical interventions, especially elective surgeries, and treatments, could increase life expectancy by avoiding iatrogenic harm. For example, reducing smoking has been the most significant medical contribution to public health in decades. Likewise, avoiding unhappiness and the things that cause distress may be better for well-being than directly pursuing happiness. The author cites examples of subtraction for health, 
like calorie restriction, removing evolutionarily novel foods like processed grains and sugars, and avoiding medications when possible. The author avoids eating and drinking anything that did not exist in the ancient Mediterranean, like oranges, mangoes, and soft drinks. The general principle is that removing novel substances and interventions that human biology has not fully adapted to can promote health and longevity. In summary, the author argues for skepticism of medical and societal interventions and recommends a subtractive via negativa approach focused on removing harm for better human well-being and longevity. Big gains in life expectancy were more likely due to societal changes than medical prowess. However, selective medical interventions for severe conditions are still warranted if one avoids overtreatment. The author argues that many traditionally seen as healthy or positive concepts often have the opposite effect. For example, things labeled as social networks are often antisocial. The knowledge economy needs to be made aware. Words like healthy are used to market things that are unhealthy. To improve his own health, the author removed many irritants and stressors from his life, like the news, social media, air conditioning, and strength training machines. He argues that becoming poorer and eliminating excess comforts and conveniences can have benefits. The author discusses medical iatrogenics, harm unintentionally caused by medical treatments or advice. He argues that much of this comes from excessive wealth, sophistication, and partial knowledge rather than poverty, simplicity, and ignorance. He suggests that separating some people from their fortunes may simplify their lives and make them healthier. The author argues that religion often has invisible purposes beyond its literal doctrines. One benefit of religion is that it limits intervention bias and the resulting iatrogenic. In cases where medical intervention may do more harm than good, religion gives people solace and allows nature to run its course. The author accommodates the rules of his Orthodox Christian faith. The author discusses the benefits of irregularity and randomness. He argues against strict regularity in areas like food consumption, based on Jensen's inequality, the principle that average effects do not always equal cumulative effects. The author argues humans are revolutionarily adapted to the haphazard and irregular availability of food sources. Getting nutrients randomly and episodically, rather than at every meal, may have benefits. Deprivation, followed by recovery, is a stressor that humans can benefit from. The author argues that the theory behind the Cretan diet and the resulting popularity of the Mediterranean diet is an example of convexity bias, it naively attributed health benefits to the types of food rather than the irregularity and randomness of consumption. The author argues for the benefits of randomness, irregularity, randomness, subtractive strategies, intermittent deprivation over strict regularity, excess sophistication, and constant abundance and convenience. He believes this approach can achieve true wealth, good health, fitness, strong relationships, and life satisfaction. The author discusses the benefits of fasting and food deprivation, which many ignore or underestimate. Researchers are discovering that episodic food deprivation can have health benefits and make us sharper and fitter. Biological studies show that the human body activates mechanisms in response to hunger, such as autophagy, in which cells break down proteins and recombine amino acids. Some researchers believe autophagy is critical to longevity. Religions that incorporate ritual fasts may have wisdom that scientists have missed. Fasting brings non-linearities to food consumption that match how our biology works. A little food deprivation has benefits, but too much causes harm. Walking and physical activity should be considered and addressed in modern life. Ancestors spend much more time walking, which may have benefits we need to understand fully. The author believes walking is essential based on our evolutionary history, even without scientific studies proving it. The author criticizes the modern obsession with living as long as possible and achieving immortality through science. For the ancients, the worst fate was not death but a dishonorable death. We used to sacrifice for the group and future generations, not just maximize our lifespan. The author has a deep moral revulsion for those seeking radical life extension and immortality. Our anti-fragility comes from the mortality of individuals. We are here to produce offspring, books, and information, not necessarily to live forever as individuals. Our genes may seek immortality, but we should accept death and make room for future generations. In summary, the author argues that we underestimate the benefits of stressors like fasting, food deprivation, and physical exertion. We have become too focused on individual longevity rather than the continuity of humanity and future generations. Ritual fasts and an acceptance of mortality may have more wisdom than the modern obsession with extreme life extension. The author discusses skin in the game as the only true mitigator of fragility and harm from asymmetry and agency problems. Historically, 
societies incentivized people to face downside risks for the benefit of others through concepts of heroism and courage. Today, however, power and benefits accrue to those who impose costs on others without facing costs themselves. The author presents a triad of groups, those who benefit from harming others without cost, those who neither harm nor benefit others, and those who sacrifice themselves for the benefit of others. The author argues that societies depend most on the last group for robustness and anti-fragility. The concept of courage and heroism has evolved. Initially, courage referred to martial or physical valor. It then grew to include courage in facing death or sacrifice for the collective good. Finally, courage evolved to mean standing up for and dying for one's ideals or values. The author views this final form of courage as the definition of the modern human. The author criticizes middle-class values and the cult of hard work for large corporations as removing heroism and courage. The author sees technology as enabling cowardice by allowing people to harm others from a distance without courage or skin in the game. The author notes that while those with skin in the game are not necessarily right, grandiose or public sacrifice is not required for courage. Many people exhibit courage through the patient's fight against evil daily without recognition. The author defines a half-man as someone who does not take risks for their opinions. The author discusses how gladiators were essentially volunteers seeking opportunities for courage, honor, and glory, not forced labor. Spectators cared little for non-volunteers who did not exhibit courage. The author's most significant lesson in courage came from observing how people face death. The author learned the importance of dignity and megalosycan, greatness of soul, from his father. His father demanded respect and was willing to sacrifice his dignity. Once, he refused to comply with a militiaman during the Lebanese Civil War and was shot in the back as he drove away. This taught the author that true dignity must be earned by taking risks. The author argues that modern society has created many professions that benefit from the fragility of others without facing risks themselves. This asymmetry needs to be addressed. An ancient solution is found in Hammurabi's code, which imposed symmetrical punishments on builders if a house collapsed and caused harm. The idea incentivizes builders to ensure safety since they know the risks better than inspectors. The author presents two heuristics from Fat Tony. 1. Never get on a plane if the pilot is not on board. 2. Make sure there is a co-pilot. The first addresses asymmetry in risks and rewards. The second addresses the need for redundancy. The author coins the term talker's free option to refer to those who give opinions and make predictions without facing the consequences if they are wrong. This is unethical. Speculative risk-taking is necessary. You must have skin in the game and face harm if your opinions or predictions cause harm to others. In the past, the privileged classes bore more risks, like being first in battle. Now, talk and predictions have more influence than ever while avoiding risks and consequences. This is a patent setback. Examples are given of talkers like Sartre, who were wrong in their predictions but maintained status, versus those like Raymond Aron, who was proper but dull and uncharming, so less remembered. The author expresses disgust for the journalist Thomas Friedman whose misguided opinions, not tempered by risk or consequence, contributed to the Iraq War. In contrast, the ancients believed that even those who fail if they take risks deserve higher status than talkers. The key message is that risks, rewards, and consequences must be symmetrical across society. Those who opine, advise, and predict must face harm if they are wrong or do not indeed have an opinion, just empty words. This concept of skin in the game can mitigate the fragility that arises from the excessive spread of misguided opinions and predictions in the modern information age. The author criticizes opinion makers like Thomas Friedman and Joseph Stiglitz, who advocate for policies and make public statements without facing the consequences of being wrong. Specifically, Thomas Friedman supported the 2003 Iraq invasion but faced no penalty for that mistake and continues to write columns for the New York Times. The author argues that there should be penalties for wrong opinion makers who harm society. Joseph Stiglitz wrongly believed the risks of default for Fannie Mae were negligible prior to the 2008 financial crisis. However, rather than face the consequences, Stiglitz now claims he predicted the crisis. The author dubs this the Stiglitz syndrome, when someone contributes to causing a problem but convinces themselves and others, they predicted and warned against it. This is aided by selective memory, analytical skill blindness to risk, and lack of skin in the game. The author argues that natural systems and societies penalize those who make mistakes, but opinion makers are often anti-fragile, volatility and being wrong benefit them. The consequences of their bad advice do not harm them. The author wants predictors to face visible harm from their errors, not push those errors onto society. Actions reveal the truth, unlike words which can be cherry-picked.
Investigating someone's actual decisions and investments reveals whether they indeed anticipated risks. The author values risk takers who have skin in the game. However, society is moving away from that. The main point is that opinion makers like Stiglitz, who do not face the consequences for being wrong and even contributing to problems, should not then be praised as predicting those same problems. Their misunderstandings make future crises more likely. The author finds this nauseating. So, in summary, the key arguments are, 1. Opinion makers should face penalties for being wrong in aligning incentives with society. 2. Selective memory, analytical skill, and lack of skin in the game allow some opinion makers to make problems worse while claiming prescience. 3. Actions and accurate decisions reveal the truth in a way words alone do not. 4. Risk takers with skin in the game drive progress, but society is moving away from that model. The author criticizes academics who propose contradictory ideas without facing the consequences or withdrawing previous claims. This allows them to convince themselves that they were right all along. The author argues that we should judge experts based on whether their actions and portfolios align with their predictions and advice, not just their words. Talk is cheap. The frequency of being right is less important in practice than consequences. If you have an anti-fragile strategy, it only takes being right once to win big. A single loss can ruin those with fragile strategies. Decision-making in the real world is more practical, focusing on actions and consequences. More than predictions and arguments alone should be more pragmatic. It is better to be a doer than just a talker. Evolution and natural selection favor survival and success, only some are most frequently right or have the best arguments. The real world rewards those who make the right decisions and take the right actions for the right or wrong reasons. The ancients, like the Romans, understood these principles and built mechanisms to counter agency problems and incentivize the right behaviors. The Romans used punishment, accountability, and alignment of incentives to prevent cowardice, shirking responsibility, and hiding behind the collective. The key takeaway is that we need to make talk less cheap by judging experts and decision makers based on their actions and results, not just their words and predictions. The Arab commander Tariq burned his ships after landing in Spain in 711 to force his outnumbered troops to fight courageously. Other leaders like Cortes and Agathocles have used this tactic of eliminating escape options to inspire bravery. The 10th century Arab poet Almutan Abi boasted his courage and skill in his poems. To avoid dishonor after fleeing from an attack by a tribe he had insulted, Almutan Abi turned to fight and was killed. He is still revered today for dying to back up his words. The author admired the French writer André Malraux who lived an adventurous life and wrote about profound topics. Malraux avoided idle chatter and small talk. Malraux's death saddened the author. Academics and researchers often do not apply their theories and methods to their own lives. This is the problem of insulation. For example, Harry Markowitz created portfolio theory but did not use it for his investments. The author suggests judging researchers based on whether they eat their cooking. Champagne socialists advocate socialist policies and sumptuary laws but lead lavish lifestyles themselves. This hypocrisy undermines their views. Examples include François Mitterrand and wealthy advocates of higher taxes which avoid paying more taxes themselves. In contrast, activists like Ralph Nader exhibit integrity by living according to the values and changes they advocate. They have soul in the game. Prophets have an idea and are the first to believe in it and see it through sincerely. They pledge belief and commitment, not just words. Having skin in the game and accepting downside risk distinguishes genuine thinkers from empty talkers. The stock market enables a massive transfer of anti-fragility from individuals to corporations and their managers. While investors take on downside risk, managers profit from volatility via stock options. This asymmetry leads to a transfer of money from society to managers. Two paths with the same average but different volatility profiles will lead to different payoffs for managers, who benefit from volatility, and society, which does not. This is evident in the fates of managers who profited while leading firms to failure. Proposed solutions like clawbacks do not solve this issue because managers still have no downside risk. Historically, some societies employed harsher penalties for failure. Adam Smith was wary of the limited liability of joint stock companies and managers' weak incentives to watch over other people's money. His version of capitalism tried to minimize the number of people with upside but no downside. Corporations often sell goods and services that are fragilizing or of little value, profiting by adding unnecessary consumption rather than enabling useful subtractions. They market these goods and services aggressively to drive growth. The author sees corporations like Coke and Pepsi that sell unhealthy products in a similar light as tobacco companies. However, they are less fragile than authors and other artisans creating more valuable goods. 
The author argues that large corporations and bureaucracies cannot be remarkably intelligent or ethical because executives simply cannot handle that level of mental rigor or independent thinking. They act more like slick actors than entrepreneurs. The author provides an example of a CEO who boasted about employing 600,000 people but was quickly exposed as merely extracting benefits from taxpayers and harming small businesses. The author finds that small companies and artisans tend to provide healthy, naturally needed products, whereas large companies, like pharmaceuticals, tend to produce wholesale harm and rely on marketing and lobbying to make money. The author only discovers products he likes through word of mouth, not marketing. Marketing, he argues, is meant to confuse customers and sell inferior or evil products. The author argues that corporations are designed to produce the cheapest product that meets a given specification. They have an incentive to cut costs, not provide quality. Publishers want to produce the most perishable item that can still be called a book. Marketing beyond information is insecurity. The author compares boastful individuals to boastful companies. We dislike boastful individuals but accept boastful companies. However, companies, like individuals, have layers of dishonesty. Mild, self-promotion, more serious, misrepresenting themselves. Most serious, manipulating customers using psychology. The system pushes companies to the most severe level. Corporations like things like shame, pity, honor, and generosity that individuals have. They only serve metrics and shareholder interest. They would collapse quickly without lobbying and corrupting governments. They delay collapse at the public's expense. The author argues you should trust a mobster's word over a civil servant's. Institutions like honor, individuals have it. He uses D.E. Lawrence as an example of governments breaking promises to individuals. In contrast, mobsters depend on keeping their word. Socrates would be most surprised by the absence of enslaved people in today's society. Although there are still metaphorical slaves today who depend on their jobs and bosses, there is a treadmill effect where people have to earn more to constantly maintain their standard of living. This causes greed and debt. The wealthy become dependent on keeping up with their wealthy peers. They are tantalized like Dantalus, always chasing more but never satisfied. In ancient Rome, social life was between patrons and their poorer clients. The patrons provided for the clients and helped them in times of need. This was private charity, not public welfare. Provincial landowners also held open houses where people could eat. On the other hand, court life led to corruption as people tried to gain status. Professionals can become enslaved to their profession and develop self-serving opinions that harm the collective. For example, the author was once asked to donate to certain politicians that were good for business as part of his job. If he had done so, he would no longer have been able to give objective political opinions. While individuals act in self-interest, the collective does not require altruism, as Adam Smith showed. However, individuals cannot be trusted to give opinions on public affairs and collective matters when acting out of professional self-interest. They lack skin in the game for the collective. The point is not that making a living in a profession is terrible but that professionals become suspects when dealing with public matters that affect others outside their profession. According to Aristotle, a free person can give opinions freely, not out of self-interest. Professionals need this freedom. The author discusses the concept of freedom and how it has been viewed historically. Initially, for the ancient Greeks, freedom meant having leisure time to participate in the political process and public life. Like artisans, those who worked for a living were not truly free. Freedom was associated more with one's social class and birth rather than one's profession. The author then discusses how freedom evolved to focus on self-ownership and the courage to have one's opinion. The truly free person is one who cannot be squeezed into doing something he would otherwise never do. This view recognizes that freedom is independent of wealth, status, or occupation. The author uses the example of Alan Blinder, a former Federal Reserve official, to illustrate the difference between legal and ethical. Blinder tried to sell the author an investment scheme that took advantage of a loophole to get taxpayer-funded insurance for wealthy investors. Although legal, the author saw this as unethical. In general, the more complex regulations become, the more opportunities there are for people with inside knowledge, like former regulators, to profit from loopholes and asymmetries at the public's expense. This is a franchise granted to insiders. The author argues that fitting a narrative to justify one's actions after the fact is problematic. It is better to establish ethical principles up front. Opinions that benefit the speaker but are framed as benefiting the public good are fraudulent. The key is determining whether the speaker is arguing for a position that benefits themselves or society. In summary, the author traces the concept of freedom from ancient times to the modern focus on courage and self-ownership.
The author laments how complex rules and regulations can be exploited by insiders for private gain at the public's cost, even if such actions are legal. The author recommends establishing strong ethical principles up front as a guide. The author was at a dinner where an American university professor, an advisor, and an investor in oil companies angrily criticized the climate activist Lord Nicholas Stern. Although the author did not fully understand the issues, he defended Stern against the professor's argument that there was an absence of evidence that fossil fuels caused harm. The author pointed out that we are conducting an unprecedented experiment with the planet, so the burden of proof should be on those disturbing natural systems, not the other way around. The author explains that he lost interest in debating the professor once he learned of the professor's conflicts of interest. He says we should give more credence to opinions that go against someone's self-interest, which he calls evidence against one's interest. The author discusses how the abundance of data today, or big data, can harm knowledge. As data sets become more prominent, spurious correlations grow faster than accurate information. Researchers can cherry-pick statistics to confirm what they want to find. The author says data is best used to debunk ideas, not confirm them. However, getting funding and interest in replicating and debunking existing studies. It is difficult for the author to criticize the tyranny of the collective in academia and science. People will endorse ideas or methods not because they believe in them but because everyone else is doing it. However, science should be about evaluating ideas on their own merits rather than based on popularity or what will lead to career advancement. The author gives examples of students and universities promoting methods the author believes are scientifically invalid simply because they are commonly accepted. He says this perpetuates fraud and is an ethical problem. In summary, the key ideas are, consider the incentives and conflicts of interest behind opinions, not just the opinions themselves. Be wary of big data and spurious correlations. Data is better for debunking than confirming ideas. Science should be about evaluating ideas on their own merits, not based on popularity or career incentives. Everyone else is doing it is not a valid argument in science. The key idea is that everything in the world gains or loses from disorder and uncertainty. Things that lose from volatility are fragile, while things that gain from it are anti-fragile. Most modern institutions are fragile because they are averse to disorder and try to eliminate randomness and volatility. However, many natural and complex systems are anti-fragile because they evolve and strengthen through volatility. The triad refers to this spectrum, fragile, robust, and anti-fragile. Many things we build are fragile while nature is largely anti-fragile. We should aim to build more anti-fragile systems and make fragile ones more robust. A fundamental asymmetry exists between the upside and downside. Anti-fragile systems have more upside than downside from volatility, while fragile systems have more downside than upside. Many modern systems deprive anti-fragile systems of the variability and errors they need. A Procrustean bed refers to situations where oversimplification causes harm. Fragilistas make systems more fragile by trying to eliminate volatility and randomness. The lecturing bird's effect refers to the mistaken belief that knowledge flows from academia to practice. Touristification refers to trying to eliminate randomness and spontaneity from life. Rational flanners are opportunistic and open to revising plans based on new information. In summary, fragility and anti-fragility are fundamental attributes that apply to all systems. We should aim to build anti-fragile systems, make fragile ones more robust and avoid frugalistas who oversimplify complexity. Recognizing this triad and asymmetry can help in many domains, from personal philosophy to institutional design. A flaw nurse seeks optionality and takes a non-narrative approach to life. The barbell strategy combines two extremes, one safe and one speculative. It provides more robustness than a single strategy. Iatrogenics refers to harm caused by the healer or expert. Generalized iatrogenic applies this to policymakers and academics. The tantalized class makes more than minimum wage but always want more. They can be manipulated with a good narrative. Black swan errors refer to unpredictable, high-impact events. A non-predictive approach is robust to changes in the future. The lesions focus on exposure and payoff. Aristotelian focus on logic and truth. Conflating an event with exposure to the event is a mistake. Naturalistic risk management trusts nature over human models. The burden of evidence falls on those disrupting the natural order. The ludic fallacy mistakes mathematical models for complex reality. Anti-fragile tinkering makes minor, manageable errors to gain knowledge. Hormesis is when small doses of a stressor improve resilience. Naive interventionism prefers action to inaction, often causing harm. Naive rationalism assumes human reason can explain everything. The turkey fallacy fails to anticipate change.
the inverse assumes change will never happen. Doxastic commitment means only trusting those with skin in the game. Heuristics are practical rules of thumb that can also mislead us. Opaque or Dionysian heuristics seem irrational but persist for reasons we do not fully understand. The agency problem occurs when managers act in self-interest over the interests of owners or society. It creates fragility. Hammurabi's risk management hides risks to avoid penalties. The green lumber fallacy mistakes a visible attribute, like lumber, for the underlying source of value. Skin in the game means sharing risk and accountability. The captain goes down with the ship. Empedocles style refers to naturally recurring choices we make without fully understanding why. Cherry picking selects data to support one's argument, ignoring counter evidence. Ethical problems often transfer asymmetry, fragility, to others. Rational optionality allows changing one's mind based on new evidence. Ethical inversion fits ethics to one's actions rather than vice versa. The narrative fallacy fits a story to events without causal evidence. The narrative discipline uses stories to convince others. Non-narrative action is right for reasons unrelated to any story. A robust narrative does not change conclusions or recommendations when assumptions change. Otherwise, it is fragile. Subtractive knowledge is knowing what is false or does not work. Via negativa defines as removing rather than adding. Subtractive prophecy predicts by removing what is fragile or unstable. The Lindy effect, non-perishable things increase in life expectancy over time. Neomania is a misguided love of change that ignores this. Opacity means we need to see or understand what is happening entirely. Mediocristin is dominated by middling, stable values. Rare, extreme values can hugely impact extremist and nonlinearities can have concave, frown, or convex, smile, effects, where small changes lead to significant impacts, positive or negative. Convexity effects refer to the benefits of nonlinearity and optionality. Adverse convexity effects lead to fragility, while positive convexity effects lead to anti-fragility. Convex functions are good, and concave functions are impaired. The philosopher's stone captures the benefits of non-linearity and optionality. Ignoring these leads to a Procrustean bed. Fragility means disliking volatility, while anti-fragility means benefiting from volatility. Fragility has a left tail, meaning it is sensitive to adverse events. Anti-fragility has a proper tail, meaning it benefits from positive events. We are transforming to a barbell structure that floors downside risks while keeping upside potential. One can only reduce the fragility of events by fully understanding them through convexity effects. It is often easier to modify exposure to events rather than get better at predicting the events themselves. The green lumber fallacy refers to confusing one's exposure to events with different functions and nonlinear properties. When exposure to events is convex, the exposure benefits from increased variance in the events. When exposure is concave, the exposure is harmed by increased variance in the events. The probability distribution of exposure to events can differ substantially from the probability distribution of the events themselves due to nonlinearities. Expectations depend more on the exposure function than the probability distribution of events, especially when the exposure function is highly nonlinear. The fourth quadrant refers to hard tail events to compute precisely but for which we can assess our exposure. All real world systems have some point of maximum harm so they become convex on one end and concave on the other. Boundedness of harm leads to convexity somewhere. Initially, concavity was dominant but local. Figure 28 shows a broader range in the story of the stone and pebbles. At some point, the concave turns convex as maximum harm is reached. The bottom graph shows strong anti-fragility with no known upper limit. These types of payoffs are only seen in unbounded economic variables. Figure 29 shows weak anti-fragility with a bounded maximum typical. Figure 30 shows a convex concave function, leading to fragility. The bottom graph shows pseudo-convexity, local anti-fragility, and global fragility. Figure 31 shows medical iatrogenic, small benefits and significant losses in probability space. This leads to a small probability of disaster and a high probability of mild benefits for a healthy person. Figure 32 shows non-linearities in biology, necessarily arising from bounded increasing functions. At low levels, the dose response is convex, becoming concave at high levels. This applies to any bounded situation, including happiness. Figure 33 shows that iatrogenic disappears non-linearly as a condition becomes more severe. The distribution shifts to anti-fragile, with large benefits and little to lose. If the treatment is increased, concavity results for maximum benefits. Figure 34 shows the hormesis of an organism. Initial benefits include slowing to harm and flattening at maximum harm. 
The bottom graph incorrectly shows initial concavity. Figure 35 shows the anti-fragile inverse turkey problem. Unseen rare events are positive. Looking at a positively skewed time series leads to missing the good stuff and underestimating benefits. The bottom graph shows the Harvard problem of underestimating fragility by assuming a parameter is constant when random. Figure 36 shows the gap between predictions and reality. Planners assume low and certain costs, but outcomes are worse, and more spread out, especially for unfavorable outcomes. This applies to government deficits, IT projects, travel time, and more. The same graph shows model error from underestimating fragility by assuming a constant parameter. Figure 37 shows a histogram from a Monte Carlo simulation of a government deficit as a left-tailed random variable by randomizing unemployment. The point estimate method would underestimate both the expected deficit and tail fragility. In summary, the key ideas are convexity, concavity, anti-fragility, model error, estimation error, and the risks of assuming parameters are fixed rather than stochastic. The idea of comparative advantage argues that countries should specialize in producing goods and services they are relatively better at compared to other goods and services. This allows for greater total output and consumption. However, this reasoning needs to be revised because it assumes variables like costs of production and market prices remain constant. In reality, these variables can change dramatically and unpredictably. For example, if a country specialized in wine production based on comparative advantage, a sudden drop in the price of wine could be disastrous. The costs to the country could far outweigh any previous benefits from specialization and trade. Countries are also limited in their ability to quickly change their production, unlike individuals who could switch between being doctors or secretaries. Countries are also more exposed to risks like crop failure, as was seen in the Irish potato famine. A better approach is for countries to specialize gradually based on experimentation and tinkering. They should avoid dramatic shifts into specialization based on theoretical models. Policymakers should aim to facilitate the emergence of specialization by removing obstacles rather than imposing models. To evaluate models for the fragility and second-order effects, we can probe the model by perturbing parameters and seeing how the model responds. The difference between the model's output using averaged parameter values and the model's output accounting for the range of potential parameter values represents convexity bias. We can also evaluate the model's tail sensitivity by seeing how output changes in response to extreme parameter values, representing fragility. Anti-fragility is measured by how the model responds to favorable parameter values. If the model shows high fragility or convexity bias, it is prone to model error and should not be relied upon. Portfolio optimization models that rely on estimates of parameters like volatility and correlation are prone to model error. Investors using such models may take more risk than if they had diversified based on more qualitative reasoning. The more the models rely on low correlations that do not reflect tail dependencies, the more the risk of overallocation and extreme losses. In contrast, an investor who knows the limitations of such modeling may allocate more conservatively. In summary, Theoretical models of economic phenomena like specialization, finance, employment, growth, etc., can be helpful but dangerous if their fragility, model error, and tail risks are not properly assessed. Qualitative and experimental approaches are often superior. Policymakers and investors should be wary of theoretical models that do not address potential second-order effects. There is parameter uncertainty in models that are used to calculate probabilities. This uncertainty causes small probabilities to be underestimated, especially for rare events. This is because small probabilities are very sensitive to parameter errors and perturbations. Even tiny parameter errors or uncertainties can lead to vast underestimations of small probabilities. The rarer an event is, the more its probability is underestimated due to parameter uncertainty. For rare events, the probabilities can be underestimated by orders of magnitude. Tiny probabilities become incomputable because they require near-infinite precision in the parameters, which is impossible. This logic extends to estimating probabilities from data. The error explodes if an event is so rare that its theoretical probability is close to 1 slash sample size. Uncertainty compounds upon itself. Errors have errors, which have more errors. Taking into account these higher order errors leads to severely underestimated probabilities and fat tailed distributions, even with Gaussian models. For example, the probability of an event said to happen once per million years could increase to once per 30 years after properly accounting for uncertainty. The author has spent over three years in seclusion, thinking about nonlinearities, fragility, and uncertainty. He is impatient with superficial or institutional knowledge that needs to follow arguments to their logical conclusions. His ideas only depend on one paper or result, 
except those that debunk others. The author refers to charlatans who propose the discredited fourth quadrant framework, indicating his low opinion of some researchers. The author's ideas could have been faster to gain acceptance because they are counterintuitive and go against the prevailing platonic vision of knowledge as timeless, precise, and independent of the observer. However, they are logically and empirically sound. The author argues that uncertainties, errors, and nonlinear relationships mean rare events and extreme outcomes are hard to predict and model. However, accepting this can lead to more robust choices and policies. The author showed empirically that extreme, unpredictable events, fat tales, dominate economic and social variables. This means that standard statistical methods like regression analysis, standard deviation, correlation, etc. do not work. Most analyzes in economics and finance could be more reliable as a result. The author argues that we should accept the presence of extreme events and build anti-fragile systems. Anti-fragile systems gain from disorder and volatility. However, most institutions ignore this evidence and build fragile systems. Examples of anti-fragile systems include city-states, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Switzerland. These systems have decentralized power and can adapt to changes. In contrast, modern states are prone to failure due to their rigidity and vulnerability to extreme events. Randomness and trial and error are helpful for problem solving. Examples include random searches for oil and randomizing politicians. Top-down intervention often fails due to a lack of local knowledge. Many practices spread through professional communities even though there is little evidence they work, for example, tonsillectomies. This naive interventionism is harmful and anti-fragile systems can help avoid it. In summary, we should design systems with decentralized control that benefit from volatility and allow for small-scale trial and error and randomness. This will make society more robust and prosperous. Large, fragile systems with rigid ideologies should be avoided. The key concepts are fat tails, anti-fragility, city-states, naive interventionism, and decentralized control. The main argument is that we must incorporate unpredictability and randomness to gain from a disorder rather than build fragile systems prone to extreme failure. The author criticizes the assumption that prosperity in one society can be easily replicated in another. Success often depends on luck and circumstances. Examples of unforeseen events, the China famine, George Washington's death, and resistance to hand-washing practices. Stabilization policies often backfire. Complex systems lead to extreme events, fat tails, through dynamic feedback loops and leverage. This violates the assumption of independent variables in the central limit theorem, preventing convergence to a normal distribution. Providing people with mathematical formulae can increase their appetite for risk by creating an illusion of precise measurement. Probabilistic estimates of extreme events are speculative, not measurements. The belief that science equals precision has led to harmful risk models. Knowledge from experience, anecdotes, should be considered. Disconfirming evidence from single events can be informative. Researchers too readily dismiss such evidence as anecdotal. Good outcomes are noticed less readily than bad ones. Economic growth was slower than often assumed. The spread of cheating depends partly on perceiving others as cheaters. Optionality, the ability to benefit from uncertainty, favors the wealthy through a rich get richer effect. They gain disproportionately from societal changes, as their wealth reacts non-linearly to increasing inequality. The teleological fallacy assumes that nature has a predetermined purpose or final cause. This belief influenced Aristotle and much of subsequent philosophy. However, the world is not beholden to human intentions or moral concerns. Failure and adversity can build character. Berkelage, creatively using the tools and materials, favors optionality. The wealthy have more options to recombine resources in new ways. New technologies provide more room for bricolage and optionality. The effect of a slight change in wealth inequality, measured by the Gini coefficient, can be significant, regardless of the exact shape of the wealth distribution. For example, a 0.01 increase in the Gini coefficient, which ranges from 0 to 1, can correspond to an 8% increase in GDP.